Just so you know, there are anthems later on. Ah, oh, brilliant. One in Polish as well. Ah. Oh. Sunday is traditionally the day of rest. A time for tranquility ahead of the working week. Not tonight. WBO Cruiserweight World Champion Chris Billum Smith has his hands full as he faces a tough and rugged man on a mission in the shape of Mateus Masternak. Others may have taken an easier first title defense, but that is not the cloth that the gentleman is cut from. We're on the South Coast for Fight Night Live on Talksport 2. Welcome to the Bournemouth International Centre. I'm Adam Catterall. It is a pleasure to be in your company on TalkSport 2 for Chris Billum-Smith's first world title defence against Matthias Masternak. Also on this card tonight, Olympians Lauren Price and Ben Whitaker will be throwing down for your pleasure and accompany me, as always, the top quality TalkSport boxing team of Spencer Oliver and John Rowling. Gareth A. Davis will hopefully be joining us a little bit later on as we cross over live at 8.30 to talk sport for that main event. Tonight, though, it is all about the Cruiserweight World Championship. Chris Billen smith snaffled this title earlier on this year in this city at uh, Vitality Stadium, the home of his beloved Bournemouth, as he beat Lawrence Okole to become the WBO Cruiserweight Champion. And tonight, he takes on the tough and rugged Matthias Masternak, a man that has been there and done it on the European scene, but tonight has dreams and aspirations of himself of becoming the world champion. Spencer Oliver! You have been on the South Coast all week this week, in and around it, talking to these guys. The buzz in the city is absolutely at an all-time high for this festive season showdown. Yep, it absolutely is. You know, you're right in what you say there. We go back to May, Vitality Stadium, where Chris Billum smith Fox's old gym mate, sparring partner in Lawrence Okoli, and picked up the WBO Cruiserweight title. It was a messy affair. Chris done what he had to do to get victory there. That elevates you to a, to another level. When you become go from challenger to champion, elevates you to another level. I'm expecting something big from Chris Billum Smith here. Actually, goes by the nickname of the gentleman, as you know, or as we all know. Very nice, very likable guy. So actually, when you speak to him, you think, how's this guy even a boxer? He is that type of guy. But 
I saw him a little bit edgy yesterday at the weigh-in. You know, he was a little bit snappy. Wouldn't shake Mat uh, Mateus Matanak's hand. He was, he was you know, he, I saw something in him that I hadn't seen before. And I'm expecting to see that in this, in this ring tonight. I mean, potential banana skin this one. Tough fight. Because Mastanak is one of those guys, been around for 17 years, been around former European champion, boxer likes of Tony Bellew, 2015, pushed Bellew actually right to the wire, lost by a round or so, but he hasn't deteriorated at all. If anything, he's actually got better, and he looked in phenomenal shape at the open workouts earlier on as well. I'm a big fan of this fight tonight. I've got to, I've got to admit, I'm sick to death of being at fights where I'm talking about title defences that are classed as tick-overs and easy walks in the park. And you could have forgiven Chris Bill and Smith for one tonight. You know, he had a tough one earlier on in the year against Lawrence of He becomes champion. You can have a homecoming. You can have that parade in front of the fans. Tonight is a parade in front of the fans, but he's going to have to work for it because Matthias Masternak is a serious operator. This is a proper fight tonight, Spence. Absolutely. Listen, I said to Chris, you know, why uh, Matthias Masternak? You know, stylistically... This is going to be tough. You know you've got to go down in the trenches. You know you have to bite down on your gum shield. Why would you choose that as a voluntary? And he said, Spence, if I want to be the best, I've got to box the best. And I don't care who that is, whether that's a mandatory, voluntary. I want, you know, the only defeat on my record, Richard react for. I'm happily box him again, you know, depending on where Richard goes. The Lawrence Akoli rematch, that's looming as well. Does he go down that route? He said, listen, give me any one of them. Jai Opataya, the guy that many consider the best, the best, the monster of the division. Yes, please, give me the unification. This guy wants all the big fights right now, hence why he's taking on Masternak. And it is, trust me, when I say this, there are people, Johnny Nelson only uses as an example, who fancy Masternak to win tonight, to tear up the script, to ruin the party. We love it down here in Bournemouth. We love coming <laughs> back to Bournemouth. It's a place that I have fallen in love with. Some great stories to tell you through the night, by the way, with Harry Redknapp and some Mark Redknapp oh, yeah. going in the sea. Oh, yeah. You heard it right, going in the sea. At 8 o'clock this morning, I believe. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic place. You know, it's here on a Sunday because obviously all the football fans, they were playing away. They had a good, a good win away, was it, to United? Yeah, I believe it was. They went and beat them. Absolutely. So they're going to come back. They're buzzing. You know, he has a legion of fans that follow him from that football sort of um, crowd. Yeah. And they're going to all be in here tonight. Sold out arena. The atmosphere, if you remember, guys, when we were here, when Chris Billum Smith boxed Chamberlain, Isaac Chamberlain, the atmosphere in here was absolutely insane. Well, guess what? We're silly season. It's Christmas season. People are going to go crazy tonight. I've seen the fancy dress crew out and, all, out and about already uh, in Bournemouth. Uh, we are live, by the way, on the TalkSport Boxing YouTube channel. So if you want to watch along uh, with us watching along, it's a bit goggle boxy, but you're more than welcome to come and join us uh, and get involved in the comment section as well. And I'm sure uh, as you are listening to the dulcet tones of John Rowling calling through these fights a little later on this evening, uh, you will be uh, obviously being able to enjoy and contribute uh, to the programme as well. Johnny, if I can bring you in for uh, a moment here, just on this main event tonight, it's important that in the aftermath of this, if Chris Billum Smith is successful this evening, that he gets the full credit for a win over someone like a Matthias Masternak, because it is a proper challenge. He could have been forgiven for taking an easier touch this evening, but he's chosen not to. He's a really tough guy, Masternak, and has been for many a year. You know, I mean, he's his 53rd professional fight here tonight. He's only lost five of them. And as Spenny was telling you, he pushed Tony Bellew all the way back in 2015. And there's been, unless, unless Shane McGuigan and Billum Smith know something that I don't, I've not sort of seen any marked deterioration in him and I think on the basis of what we've seen in previous fights I think this is going to be a, a hell of a tough night this for, for Chris Billups because Masternak is absolutely chiseled out of granite he's a hard man and a, it, it's got every indication this one of being a long and attritional sort of battle I think it's got points points verdict one way or the other written all over it this uh, interestingly, speaking to Shane McGuigan, he said that Chris, since he won the title back in May, he's changed insofar as that he now has a champion's confidence. He has that aura of the champion. And he he'll, that doesn't mean that he'll go into it in any sense complacent, but he now knows that he is capable of going right to the top. WBO champion, and he wants the lot. 
I kind of like hearing things like that, Spence, because when you're climbing the mountain, that motivation is there for you. And that has always been the case for Chris Billensmith. Now he's at the top of the mountain. Even just selecting someone like uh, Matthias Masnacht, for me, kind of throws down the gauntlet and shows the indication of where he wants to go. Tells you that he's oozing confidence. You know, going from challenger to champion elevates you to another level. And we will see that tonight in Billensmith because he's got that champion's mindset now. That's what it all is. It's all about the psychological battle. And uh, Billum Smith now knows that he's world champion. He now knows that he belongs up there with the best. And, you know, he's going to he's, he's going to prove that tonight. I mean, yeah, it, you, you could forgive him for going down an easier route. You really could because Mastanak, as John Rawling just pointed out, you know, he's been there, seen it, done it, and he's still very much at the top of his game. This is a tough, tough contest. Be interested to see how Chris handles this. See, we talk about it being the homecoming for Philip Smith, which of course it is, but this, after a long, long wait, is a fantastic opportunity for Masternak. You've yeah. got to look at it from his point of view as well. You know, he is looking for an opportunity to become a world champion. If he wins tonight, it's a life changer for him. Absolutely, and from the Masternak point of view, he was the mandated challenger for Jaya Pattaya with the IBF and decided not to take that one and come for this one. That in itself shows a little bit of an indication where his head's at, that maybe he thinks that the easier route to a title is through Chris Billum smith Absolutely. Now listen, Jaya Pattaya, anyone that doesn't, doesn't think so, you know, really should think so. Jai Opataya is very much the monster of the division. I think we saw that against Jordan Thompson last time out. Jordan Thompson, many consider as a really a rising star, emerging talent. And um, the way that he dealt with Thompson, you know, he just systematically broke him down and showed the skill set that he's got. You know, he's the, he is the monster of the division. So Mastanak, stylistically, he go, do I want to fight someone like Opataya that just comes in like a steam train? Or do I want to fight Chris Billum smith who, by the way, comes in like a steam train who's like one of those fighters as well but Opatai is the man right now in the division if you're going to go one place you're going to go Billum Smith new champion you know let's see where he's at let's see you know see if he's gained that confidence right now it's, it's an interesting one it really is listen it's all set for an absolute cracker we're expecting ring walks at around about 9 p.m this evening here in Bournemouth uh, and that'll be over on TalkSport for you. We're going to be crossing over around about 8.30 uh, this evening, so make sure you get yourself over there for that main event. Uh, in the meantime, we are going to be bringing you a bit of action involving local boy Lee Cutler. He's going to be on the card uh, a little later on against Kingsley uh, Bunike. Uh, we've got Lauren Price and Ben Whittaker, obviously. Uh, two people that shot to fame through the Olympic Games and then that main event over on TalkSport with Chris Billum smith and Matthias Masternak throwing down for the WBO Cruiserweight World Championship. You can hear in the background, Big Mo is addressing the crowd right now, revving them all up and getting them ready uh, for Fran Hennessy, who is about to make her ring walk. We're going to uh, keep you updated uh, with the uh, fledgling career of Fran Hennessy as she makes her second professional ring walk. In the meantime, we're going to get stuck into some of the other major talking points that are currently going on uh, in the world of boxing. And there is quite a lot going on at the moment. Uh, and I think it's only fair that we have a quick reflection, a quick look back at what happened last night over in San Francisco as Devin Haney became the WBC super lightweight world champion really taking to school Regis Proge, a man that has been there, done it and got the t-shirt, obviously fought over here in the UK against Josh Taylor, uh, but last night he was well off it compared to what Haney looks like at 140 now, Spence, and in this weight division, he could go on to some serious, serious big fights and define a legacy. And then the big question mark was how would Haney move up? You know, would he carry that skill set? Would he pick the power up at, at the 140 pound limit? Well, we saw down at 135 last time out against Lomachenko. Many people felt he may have even lost that contest, but you could see he was weight drained. Way too big for the lightweight division. Jumps up to super lightweight, goes in against Regis Progray, the guy that people remember August 2019 was Josh Wire, uh, Josh Taylor to the wire at the O2 Arena. You know, this kid can fight. Well, guess what? Last night, he was schooled. He made him look like a novice, and that shows you where Haney's sat right now. I think he could go up again, by the way. I think he moves through the weight divisions. I think we see him up at welterweight. We see him at 147, because he's got that size, he's got that frame, but he looks so much more suited to the 140-pound limit last night. Hurt Regis a couple of times, had him on the floor and put in a punch-perfect performance and actually stamped his place as maybe top one, two or three in the world, pound for pound. Look at you. You've gone big early doors. I like it, man. 
John, I just want to bring you in on the Devin Haney train before I let, I'll let you crack on with the uh, Fran Hennessy fight. He's 25 years of age, this boy. He's already a two-weight world champion. A performance like that last night, he is well on the way to greatness. Well, people are people are looking at him, aren't they? And some of the some of the big names have posted their reaction about his performance overnight. And I think it's fair to say that there's been a unanimous acclaim of what he produced. There were plenty who thought that Progre would have had the skill set to have provided him some awkward moments and to have made him a very much closer, made it a very much closer fight than it was. But ultimately, Haney showed himself to be exceptional. And he's, as Spencer said, he's right up there now in the pound for pound rankings. And who knows, if he goes all the way up to 147, there are super fights there. They are. They're absolutely super fights at 147. But for me, I don't know where you're at with this, Spence. I don't want to see that just yet. The reason why I don't want to see that just yet, this is his first one at 140. He's taken on the WBC champion and beaten him in Regis Progre. As I look around the other runners and riders at 140, we've got Tiafimo Lopez, who's the WBO champion. We've also got the opportunity maybe for Ryan Garcia to snap himself the WBA belt in there as well. Shakur Stevenson isn't going to be too far behind. He's going to be at lightweight coming through to 140, maybe in the next year, two years. Those names. We've got Javante Davis floating around as well. Yeah, don't, but listen, don't go to 147 <laughs> yet. These are the monster fights. Absolutely, these are the fights, the super fights. And they're the fights. You know what I like it uh, about in America right now? That they, we are starting to get those fights. We're making those super fights, whether yeah. that's at a catch weight. We're getting the big names of the division. And guess what? I think PBC, they've done a new deal with Amazon Prime. I yeah. think we're going to see some huge fights on there as well with the names that you've just mentioned very much in the mix I think uh, that's that's certainly the case and we're going to be able to watch them but I think it's boxing having had to respond to the threats from mixed martial arts UFC you know that they've had to put these fights on because for too long people have been saying proper fights in boxing are not happening yep. and that too many people are being protected and I think those days because of the rivalry coming from elsewhere those days are hopefully Thank gone you, Absolutely, and fingers crossed we are going to get to see uh, some of the fights that I've just been mentioning there. What would you like to see Devin Haney do next? Who would you like to see him in with? Do you know what? I think there's, there's, there's options for Devin Haney. Um, I just want to see him in the big fights. I want to see him in the super fights. You know, I, you know the names you mentioned, like, like a Ryan Garcia-type fighter. I want to see that. You know, Javante Davis is a fighter I would love to see as well. Shakur Stevenson. All the names that you've mentioned, that's where we want Which to see Which is the toughest? Shackle, it, Steve, Shackle Stevenson's probably the best of the lot. Yeah. Javante, they, they all carry different skill sets. Yes. Javante Davis, very heavy-handed, dangerous southpaw, comes in from a low stance, throws shots from good angles. Shackle Stevenson's very slick, works well, controls the space really well. Ryan Garcia, incredible hand speed, big left hook. I mean, that's where we're going right now. That's where we're at. The beautiful thing about watching Devin Haney last night, he's 25 years of age, the jab, the footwork, the range control, all that is brilliant. But the most impressive thing is that composure. He doesn't fight on emotion at all, never gets involved. Even to the extent where he drops Regis Progre, I think in the third, doesn't chase it. Hurts him again in seven or eight, doesn't chase it. Just sticks to the game plan. Shows what superstars do, that's what superstars do, they, you know, they feed off the pressure, they control their emotions, you know, they know when to take that opportunity, you know when you're in there, when you hurt a guy, even if he's gone over, you know whether it's the right time to jump on him, to sit on him, when you're operating at that level, Adam, you're operating at that level, one false move and it's checkmate, you're in trouble, yeah. you're in big trouble, because that's where you're at there, you know, like, these fighters are elite, they are pound for pound stars, you know, they're superstars of the sport. And we're very fortunate that we've all got, we've got them all in that super lightweight division. Yeah. You know, it's the hottest division right now and there's some huge fights to be made. But all these guys that we're talking about, we're all going to have an opinion on who we think is going to win the fight. But none of us really knew. Will it be Ryan Garcia? Will it be Shaka Stevenson? Will it be Javante Davis? Will it be Devin Haney? They're all, you know, they're all there or thereabouts. And that's why we want these fights. We want these fights because you don't know. You know, too often 
with big title fights, you have a pretty shrewd idea exactly how it's going to pan out yeah. before the fight actually takes place. But in those that you've been talking about, you know, I personally think that Davis is top of that pile because he's because he's hurtful, big puncher, and I think that he'll be the one who shows himself to be the superior man. But you know, but we don't know. Yeah, it's a, it, and the one, fact the, that we can. 35 to 147 is really attractive. Yeah, right great. Now, isn't it, it is. It's brilliant. And the fact that we can have this sort of conversation underlines just how tasty it is. Yeah. I mean, here, here's where I'm sat with the names that we, we just mentioned there. Devin Haney, Shakur Stevenson, Javante Davis. Ask me to play them one, two, three. Guess what? I can't. That's how difficult it is. And That's how tight that is. They've all got a different skill set. I like John. I, I, like, I look at styles. For me... I like Davis. Yeah. Javante Davis, explosive, exciting, you know, works good angles, timing's great, controls the space. Love that. That's my sort of fighter. But Devin Haney's a difficult guy to beat. Of course. And if you look at the performance that Tiafimo Lopez put in against Josh Taylor, Vasil Lomachenko, you know, that's another name that you throw into this mix. The beautiful thing about this, and John touched upon this before, yes, there's threats elsewhere from the fan base getting fed up with the sport and moving into mixed martial arts and following the UFC. We've got to pit the best against the best as often as we possibly can to attract the casual audience. Us as hardcore fans, we're always going to be here. We're always going to keep coming back. Once a big fight's made, we're going to go, we're going to watch it. It's those casual fans, it's the football fans, the basketball fans in America in order to be attracted to the big night. And these names together will bring those big, big, big crossover and, nights. And that, that's why I think we get it. You know, that's why we got Javante Davis versus Ryan Garcia. You know, it was made at a catch weight. You know, it was just a bump. With, without a world without title. Without a world title on the yeah, line. Exactly. That's what I'm talking about. I think that that's where they recognise. John Rawling hit the nail on the head, actually. He's right in what he says. You know, you've got other sports, surrounding sports, other combat sports. UFC, for example, that are, you know, the best of fighting the best. Boxing has to respond. We even go into the YouTube boxing. You know, they're pulling in huge audiences. It's entertainment. It's WWE slash boxing slash entertainment. And that's what boxing has to follow that trend. You know, we've got the talent there right now. And now we need to ha as a, add a bit of razzmatazz to it. Yes. You know, spice it up a little bit. But make the fights. That's the most important thing. We can't have this situation like we've had in the heavyweight division for the last three or four years where, you know, we've been looking for this undisputed. We want Anthony Joshua to box Tyson Fury. You know, fights that have always been talked about and we haven't made, you know, because everything trickles down from that heavy, them heavyweights. We haven't had the big fights that we wanted there. So the other weight divisions right now, they need to start making them, you know. But what we've seen, especially in the last two, three weeks or so, and as we head on in towards the back end of this year, the big fights are happening and they're happening regularly. For a, for a boxing fan over the last couple of weeks, you've been blessed with some absolute crackers. Last night, obviously, we had what we had in the super lightweight division. Next week, we've got Sonny Edwards and Jesse Rodriguez fighting each other, you know? And that is another super fight. Okay, it's the smaller guys, but it's a super fight to determine the number one in the division, and that's what the fans want to see. Absolutely. Look, we go de December 23rd, we go over to Saudi Arabia. We've got Deontay Wilder on the card against Joseph Parker. Interesting fight. Anthony Joshua versus Otto Wallin. People that don't know Wallin, dangerous fight. Slippery southpaw. Gets into a rhythm, could make it difficult for, you know, for um, Anthony Joshua. You got, you've got um, Jarrell Miller. On there as well against Daniel Dubois. What I'm saying is, you've got a sexy card there. Might not be the fighters that we want fighting each other, yeah, but it's, it, it's, a, it's a sign of the times of what we've got to come in 2024. But not, but like that, exactly what you just said. On the big ones, Boxing Day, you've got Noye Nui taking on uh, Tapales, haven't you? Which determines number one in that division. Now, people have obviously in the in the light heavyweight division have been heavy on Bivol versus Baturbiev, but Callum Smith Baturbiev. It's a top quality fight, which is in January, uh, yeah. at the start of next yeah, year. Yeah, we've got, we've got we've got that January the 13th. We've got Callum Smith versus Baturbi. A huge fight, huge fight. You know, we're going the, in the right direction. For, is the point that I'm trying to make. Absolutely, for the boxing fan, we are getting the fights that we want to see. Like, listen, I'm a huge boxing fan. You know, we come to shows week in, week out. But I love it when we get 50-50 fights. And I think that that's what promoters are now recognising. Yeah. With the boxers, it's time to put on these 50-50 fights. We don't want to turn up at the cards now where we go, right, all the blue corner, they're going to win tonight. We Correct. know exactly where we're at. We've had all that. Correct. You know, times have moved on. It's entertainment, baby, and we need to see those big fights. Of course. And also, there's also stress as well on fan attitude towards fighters who end up getting beat. I think we've got to have a little bit more empathy if we're demanding the best fights, if we're demanding 50-50s, if we're demanding these guys take on the best challenges, if they come up short, 
still stay on the trend. Oh, listen. A, a loss, a loss is not that big of a deal. This is professional sport at I, the end of the day. I am so glad that you brought that up because you know what? The general public are so happy to write someone off once you get one defeat. Well, guess what? That's not what it's all about. When you want to create legacies and modern eras and the fights where you get best fight the best, like you did back in the days of Ali, Foreman, Norton and all those guys, you know, Fraser, you know, when you go back to them days, they all fought each other. When we think about it now, you see, and they all beat each other. Exactly, and that's <laughs> where you're at with it, you know. And, uh, and I think, you know, they come two-time world heavyweight champions, three-time world heavyweight champions. Yeah, give these guys a break. If they lose a fight, let them come back. Let them rebuild. Because that's where we're at right now. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that, by the way, if we get these sort of fights that we're expecting. 2024, you know, especially with Saudi Arabia now getting involved, the money's now there. We will get the best fighting the best, I'm sure. Whilst we're talking about the 140 pound division, where are you at with Jack Natural right now? Because there's lots of talk that they're trying to head back towards that rematch with Josh Taylor. Is that the one that you would like to see him in with? I think that that, that would justify it for me. I mean, listen, anybody that watched that fight, Jack Cattrall versus Josh Taylor, I was there, I was ringside. Nine rounds to three. It was a convincing win for Jack Taylor. He deserves that Jack rematch. Catchell. Okay, um, Jack Cattrall, sorry. He deserves he deserves that rematch against Taylor. He really does. What's, here's a question, though, for you, right? Because he's, he's highly ranked as Jack, and I believe that they've just called an eliminator for the IBF crown. So that appoints him in that direction Ten against seconds. Matthias. But from a Cattrall point of view now, what is a rematch with Taylor four. for him now and vice versa? What's in it for Taylor? Because my understanding is Josh is done with 140. He wants to head towards 147. There's no title on the line here. I appreciate there might be big money. There might be big money. I don't, I don't, I don't know what the situation is regarding the finances. But... What's in it for those guys doing the rematch now? Listen, Taylor said that there was 20% of them, uh, 20 percent of the money that he wanted from there. He said they were way off the money, and obviously that's because the undisputed wasn't on the line. So what is in it? What's in it for Jack Ketchell right now? He wants it. It's, it become personal. That's where it is. It become personal. I think it's for him, for for history, for legacy. He wants that fight with Josh Taylor to put to try and right the wrongs of the last one. That's where he's at with it. Spenny, it's the uh, it's the championship of each other, isn't it? Sometimes you don't have to have a belt on the line. Yeah. After what we've seen and what we saw in that first fight, when I think most people thought that Jack Catterall had won that fight, I think that they are aware of all the con of all the uh, discussion which has gone on thereafter, and they want to sort it out between themselves. Fingers crossed they can get it on because I'm in for that fight for 2024. It should be. Uh show you a cracker uh, you'll be delighted to know that we are live right now on our youtube channel the boxing youtube channel on talk sport you can watch uh, us talking all things boxing and we're going to be bringing you some live commentaries very shortly as lee cutler takes on kingsley Evanuke, and then we're all going to accumulate uh, at around about nine o'clock tonight over on talk sport as chris bill and smith defends the wbo cruiserweight championship of the world against matthias masternak and hot footing it from various motorways from london it is, of course, the one and only Mr. Gareth A. Davis. Was it a bit busy on those roads, my friend? Uh, big accidents on the M25. Junctions three and four here's, closed on the here's M3. Here's your traffic and travel F deck. Exactly. <laughs> Five and a half hours it takes to get from northern Essex to down to the south coast. But I'm delighted to be here. What a venue, by the way. Yeah. It's kind of like a... Uh, it's like the York Hall on steroids, isn't it? It reminds me very much of the three arena in Dublin. I don't know if you've... Uh, was coming. there on Friday night? Of course you were, yes, of course you were. Where there isn't, where it's basically, the ring is against the wall, let's yeah. just say, and covered by three corners, uh, three sides, should, should I say, for people listening to us at home. It is, it's going to be really noisy later on, because in and around town, there's a nice little buzz throughout the course of it. Spence brought up a moment or two ago, Bournemouth beat Manchester United away from home yesterday. The football fans are back in town, and they're here to support their boy, Chris Billum smith and he might need him tonight, because it's a tough one. Absolutely, and I hear there were crowds in town for Spencer, Oliver stripping off to his budgie smugglers and getting in the water this morning. Absolutely, listen it was standard procedure, Mark Mark Redknapp, Harry Redknapp's son actually I was with him last night, he said to me listen mate, every day I go in the water do you fancy it? He's talking to me Gareth, of course I fancy it I'm straight in the, oh, oh, I was in there for a good while I've got to tell you actually, I've got to tell you after doing a, a few lengths back and forth, you know. Yeah, few lengths. It's the English Channel, mate. Where were you going? France. <laughs> <laughs> Only over to the Isle of Wight and back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no, but after we, after we was in there, all right, all right, let's be realistic, 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. Coming out, 
I've, guys, this is no joke when I say this. You feel bad? I'm going to say, no, I'm going to say there's 20 to 30 other swimmers down there. Wow. It's not just like, yeah, don't think that I'm I'm the only freak out there. There's loads of them. There's a career for swimming. you then, no? <laughs> Absolutely. But look, no, it's great fun, and I'll be going there again. Trust me, I'm going there again tomorrow morning. Everyone welcome. Gareth A. Davis, if you haven't got your swimming shorts, come down in your bug budgie smugglers. Let's get it on. I'm in. I've got my Italian boxer shorts I'm going to be wearing. <laughs> There's a sight. You'll be pleased to know that we won't be streaming that, so you won't be put off your breakfast. <laughs> but it is great to be it here. Is. I mean, it was a long journey, but I, I told you last night when we were live on Aaron Talks what I was hitchhiking. I might as well have, because I think I'd have got there quicker. Yeah, I but so. it, it, I tell you what, it does feel nice. There's, I've just come in, obviously, as people are coming in. There's a massive buzz outside. There's people, there's walk-ups as well tonight. Yeah. People are Christmas shopping. They notice there's a buzz around. The, 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 the Ferris wheel is out there lit up. We are actually... We are almost a thrown throw from the beach here, aren't we, yeah, as we well? It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful feeling. Billum Smith has brought them to the Bay of Bournemouth. Absolutely. And the Christmas markets are out in full force and people are ready to rock and roll for the festive season. And we're going to be bringing you that uh, on TalkSport throughout the course of the night. Uh, one thing that me and you actually didn't speak about last night on the radio uh, was the 2024 inductees to the International Boxing oh, Hall of Fame. Yes, yes. And we've got to bring that up because we we've, have. Got, we've got a couple from our shores that have, uh, have been blessed uh, with inductions uh, 2024. The hitman himself, Ricky Hatton, congratulations to him, and a lady that absolutely paved the way for what we're all experiencing right now uh, with female fights. And it seems quite apt to be bringing this up whilst Fran, Fran Hennessy uh, is in the ring at the moment. The one and only Jane Couch. Great to see both of those two on the 2024 uh, International Boxing Hall of, Fame, Hall of Fame inductees. Absolutely, and I saw her tweets yesterday, her shock and surprise. John Rawling my, and myself, John would have been covering her for The Guardian at the time, I think. I was writing about her in The Telegraph, covering her case, believe it or not, 25, 26 years ago, with the Boxing Board of Control, taking them to the High Court. Because at the time, the Crustian system did not allow... They were Luddites at the time when it came to women's boxing. They would not allow women to box. Jane Couch is as much a lightning rod, a pathfinder, yeah, as Katie Taylor has been, John. Very, very pleased to see that she's got recognition in the uh, Canastota in the International Hall of Fame. Her, her reaction was lovely, wasn't it? It she's was. clearly absolutely, absolutely made up about it, and uh, I'm delighted for her, and I think she'll rightly be very, very proud to go over there for the induction next summer. You know there's a four-part serialisation of her life being made at the moment yeah, as well. Yeah, I heard about four that. Four kind of, like, Sunday night television, yeah. four one-hour parts, the entire story. I mean, I, I remember her debut. I covered her debut at Caesars Nightclub in Streatham. No Caesars Palace. We went everywhere. There. She shared duke rooms with journalists at times because she had no money during her career. Kev Francis, he, she slept in his room a couple of times. Really? The old Daily Star reporter. Yeah, I think yeah. it was Daily Star. She was a great character, the Fleetwood assassin. She fought everyone. She's still a wild woman today, and she's nearly 60. <laughs> I am so made up for her, but also for the hitman. Absolutely. Uh, for those that don't know the full induction, we've got Ricky Hatt and Jane Couch, of course, uh, that are going to be inducted into the class of 2024. Diego Corrales, yes. who gave us some absolute ding-dongs. Uh, Michael Mora and Ivan Calderon also uh, being featured as well next year. Uh, in the summer of next year, that is going to be some ceremony with those names on there. Absolutely. The great Diego Corrales, um, who was a wild man himself. Motorbike yeah. fanatic, of course, lost his life in that way, riding a motorbike. I think it was in Las Vegas. Yes, it was. The yeah. great fights with Jose Luis Castillo, who Ricky Hatton fought. Yeah. One of the greatest fights of all time, oh, that, by the way. Absolutely. I remember covering it. Absolutely, unbelievable fight. That, that, do you know something? I was actually speaking about Jane in the way that you've just been speaking about trailblazing and what have you. It kind of leads us on nicely to talk about the story in and around Amanda Serrano this week. Yeah. Uh, because... For those that don't know too much about this, Amanda Serrano has come out and she's uh, said that she will no longer fight for, the, for any WBC representation because the WBC uh, are refusing to give her the option of fighting 12 three-minute rounds. In her last fight, uh, she fought 12 threes and the WBC didn't sanction the fight. The WBA, the WBO and the IBF did. Uh, so going forward, uh, she will no longer uh, fight under the auspices of the WBC. What did you make of everything that came out this week? Uh, 
in and around the Amanda Serrano story. Well, I'm not, I, I am not favouring. If the women go with it and they vote for it and the sanctioning bodies go with it and the commissions deal with it and the medical evidence says it's fine 36 minutes or 30 minutes, 10 threes, I'm fine with it. But at the moment, I mean, I, I, I appreciate her stance. It's partly about money and it's partly about parity with the men and equality with the men fighting three minute rounds but there's a part of me and i know you'll all disagree with me on this i like the excitement of the two minute rounds and i think they should move to 12 twos first of all gareth i'm with you on it i'm exactly with you listen i think if it's not broke don't fix it i think that you know they've got the format there and you know we're talking about the medical side of things here with women's boxing you know the bone structure is different the skull is not as thick and i think that's why they went two minute rounds as opposed to three minute rounds and I think that, you know, that then the argument would be, well, where women don't hit as hard as men, though. So, yeah. you know, but the, the volume of punches is still there. And I just think that, you know, where they're at right now, I think they've got the balance right. We see women's boxing all the time. I think it's fantastic. I'm with Gareth. I think going up to 12 two-minute rounds would work. And I just don't think that we really need to tempt fate by moving it into the three-minute rounds just right now. Regarding, just one second. Regarding the medical aspect of it, it's all nonsense. It's absolute nonsense because what they're doing is they are drawing on evidence gained from, from rugby, from horse racing and all this. They're not using they're not using fight sports. The fight sport that they should be using is mixed martial arts where the women are fighting five but, but minutes you round know, in uh, four uh, hours uh, clubs, on, guys. On. But... but I think boxing, you, you and I know this because we cover MMA as well, boxing is inherently, in my view, people won't like this, it's inherently more dangerous than MMA. I agree with you. Now, because you get a standing count, I agree you can with fight you. concussed, I agree. MMA fights tend to be stopped quicker. I completely agree. Because of the, 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 the elbows and the knees and all. But that, that research, you rightly say, needs updating in my view. Yes. The, the, the research the WBC did was back in 2013. Yeah. I do, I would like to see, if they go ahead with it, fine. But I'd like to see some medical evidence, some deep research based on behind it as well. But, yeah, but, 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 but let me just ask this question, right? And you can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong with this, because I really don't know the answer to this. Is the bone density different from on a woman as it is to a man? What I'm saying is the skull, the thickness of the skull is thinner on a woman All right. as opposed well, to a man. But they're not being hit by a man. Yeah, they're no, being hit by yeah, a woman. But, yeah, I know they are, but it's, it's still the same thing. It's still what I'm saying no, to you. They're not hit as hard. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah I, no, but listen, when you're making weight, You've got thousands of blood vessels in and around the I, brain. I understand. The blood vessels lose that elasticity. They become like bits of straw. So it's not about the power of the punch. You actually find with a lot of people who get injured in boxing. It's repetition. It's, it's repetition as it's, opposed can, to Can we go punching. further than just bone density? Let's, let's study the entire physiology. Men and women are different, yeah. markedly different. Agree. I think, I, I, look, if, if women are pushing forward, I asked Sam Marshall, Savannah Marshall, obviously the undisputed yep. uh, super middleweight women's champion, who are literally the heavyweights of boxing. They hit the hardest, probably, of yep. all the women. Okay. Yep. I asked her about it on, on Friday night. Obviously, she's doing MMA at the moment. She's joined up with the Professional Fighters League. And she said, look, if we want to go to three-minute rounds, that's fine. I'm fine with it. It would suit my style. I can hit hard. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel, I'm with you. If the women want to move it, great. But there are so many great scientists out there now. There is so much research out there. Yeah. Let's just do the research before we I dive agree. in. And, and the thing that Amanda Serrano is arguing right now is that she wants the option for it. She's not demanding that all female fights are three-minute rounds. That's what she's saying. And I am on the, I'm on the bandwagon absolutely saying that there are certain levels within the sport that do warrant three-minute rounds, but then there are certain levels that don't warrant three-minute rounds. Amanda Serrano is an elite technician, and I am a big fan of, okay, I want it to move away from men's boxing, women's boxing. I want it to be boxing right across the board. She's an elite technician. The Katie Taylors of this world, the Chantel Cameron's of this world, the Savannah Marshalls of, and the Clarissa Shields, all those elite technicians that can absolutely do three-minute rounds. What Amanda Serrano's arguing is, give me the option. When we're around the, the, the table discussing whether we're making a fight or not, that is on the table. The WBC have categorically shut it down and not allowed that to happen. That's why she's taken the stance. She's not demanding that it happens. She's asking for the option to do it. Listen, you, you can't argue with that, you know, whether it's optional, you know, whether the champion has that 
option to pick two minute rounds, three minute rounds, whether that's 10, 10 rounds, 12 rounds. You know, there's a debate to be had there, but the WBC, as it stands right now, is no, we do 10 two minute rounds, and by you shouting that you want to do three minute rounds doesn't give you the power to be able to change it. You can understand both sides of the argument. And also, I think in the amateurs, the women do fight three minute rounds, don't they? Isn't it? It did move to 4 3. So yeah. Here's another anomaly that needs sorting out. The amateurs took their head guards off in men's boxing, but the women kept their head yeah. guards. What we need to cross the board is a, a, a detailed, and I want John in on this as well, a detailed sporting report. We've been around a long time covering it journalistically. I'd like to see it covered journalistically. I'd like to see reports out there. I'd like to see the veracity of reports but I, listen i'm with you adam i think move the sport on give the women the voice you know give the women the voice push the research but until we do that let's go slowly there has to be unanimity doesn't there is the way in which it's produced and presented i think it's uh, i think it's it's crazy having different rules for women to men i, think. I agree I, I in an ideal world you want to see you want to see it the same and being judged by the same criteria. Absolutely. Uh, John, I, I, well, I can see uh, Mick Hennessy right in front of you right now. Uh, John, just give us a quick update because Fran's fight has just completed there. Uh, she's got the victory. How did she look? She boxed very nicely. She's got great footwork. She really does move very, very well indeed, Fran Hennessy. Just 19 years old, mixed daughter. She won a six round of 59 55 against an Argentinian, Lucrezia Arieta. And in all honesty, there was at no stage did she look like she was getting beaten. Mick was uh, typically a, a sort of an anxious father sitting, watching on next to the promoter tonight. But he can relax now. He can enjoy the moment because she won and won pretty easily. Absolutely. Uh, listen, lots to come tonight. We are going to be bringing you the WBO Cruiserweight Championship of the World between Chris Bill and Smith and Matthias Mass tonight. That's coming up at around about 9 o'clock this evening. More details on that in a moment. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Fight Night live from Bournemouth.
We're in Bournemouth at the International Centre. The WBO Cruiserweight Championship of the World is on the line a little later on as Chris Phillips Smith, the hometown boy, defends against Matthias Masternak. Uh, before we move on to our next fight, which involves another local boy, Lee Cutler, we've just witnessed Fran Hennessy come through her second professional bout, and her dad, an expert for more to Mick Hennessy, is with Gareth A. Davies right now. He is indeed the legend Michael Hennessy himself, son and daughter getting in the ring these days. What do you go through, Mick, when Fran is in a war like she was just in? I, I lost my voice then, screaming and shouting about it. I'm, I'm very, very confident to be... To be uh, absolutely truthful with you Gareth because my, the only thing I worry about is that she's not gonna perform to the elite standard that she she is because she likes to scrap yeah because she likes to scrap and she because she you know she she puts a lot of pressure on herself she talks the talk and she likes to walk the walk so I'm just I just want her to be one million percent happy with her performance are and you that's the only thing I worry yeah I'm incredibly happy because that girl she just boxed it was an incredibly tough match for uh, uh, anyone's second pro fight, let alone a girl who's just turned 19. I forget it's her an second pro fight. Yeah, a, a winning record and someone who recently went the distance with the French super featherweight champ, three weights above Fran, and didn't put a dent in her, didn't even, didn't even come close to doing what Fran done. And Fran there, you could see, uh, you know, for me, the referee kept her in the flight, she kept throwing herself on the floor and that should have been sorted out and and as for him as for him giving giving the first round to the argentinian girl he, he he needs he needs having his license revoked because I, i've seen some bad things in this sport but it's becoming more and more common it's disgraceful absolutely disgraceful these officials need to be held to, to account and i know people are going to say Oh, but she won the fight. And she's but, your daughter. Yeah, and she's your daughter. Yeah, but that's a disgrace. An absolute disgrace. Did it you was... feel his collar afterwards or not? Yeah, I did. I told him. I said he needs to go to Specsavers. <laughs> um, look, let so me ask. Right. So right, by the way. No, 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 you don't. You yeah. don't. Um, we had a little debate before, uh, while Fran was on air, while, yeah. while she was in the ring, that there's a big push at the moment. Amanda Serrano is one of the pathfinders in women's boxing is pushing for three minute rounds for women. What's your take on, because we've debated it, myself, Spencer, John Rawling and Adam Cattrall already, that should it go to three rounds? Should there be more medical research? Should we move slowly? Should it be 12 twos? What's your view? Well, look, I'm all for equality as, as we all are. Um, and, and I happen to have a big stake in this because not only is my daughter doing it at a high level, but I've also got the unified super middleweight champion in Savannah Marshall. So um, for me, I, I do wonder, I mean, look, it would, three minute rounds would suit Fran because she would have definitely knocked her out with three minute rounds. And Fran actually, when she won her national title and when she won best fighter of the Golden Girl tournament, she was doing three minute rounds. So she would love that. And Savannah being a puncher, three minute round suit her. But the question for me is, will it be as exciting because the two-minute rounds are fast and furious, and women's boxing is so on such a massive up at the moment. Will that change it? Well, we're going back to the desk. Very quick one, tiny answer. Do you think there needs to be more medical research before they move it or not? For, for, for women? No, no, because maybe start with 10 frees and then adjust it, maybe 12 frees if need be, but most of these elite girls are used to doing three minute rounds anyway. So, um, you know, for them to do three minute rounds, it's not a problem. They just slightly slow the pace down. Can I ask you one more thing before we go back? You, look, yeah. you found Tyson Fury, you promoted him at the beginning. Yeah. What did you make of his fight the other day with Francis Ngannou? Sad to see, to, to be fair, sad to see. So, it's not the fighter I knew. Mick, it's always brilliant to see you. You are a legend. Are you swimming with us in the sea in the morning? Myself, Spencer Oliver, budgie smugglers in the morning or not? You really would go viral if that happened. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm, I'm leaving you in peace. Back to you, Adam. Uh, top stuff. Mick Hennessy there with Gareth A. Davies, his daughter, Fran, uh, boxing in a second professional contest just a month or two ago and coming through extremely uh, successfully. Uh, right, coming up, we're going to be uh, bringing you Olympians Lauren Price and Ben Whittaker. They're going to be in the ring here in Bournemouth. Later on, it's Chris Billum smith versus Matthias Masternak for the WBO Cruiserweight Championship of the World. Right now, though, 
it's always good to have a little bit of an English title on there as well. Uh, with Lee Cutler, local boy, taking on Kingsley Ebunike. Uh, you've been across this all week, uh, Spencer. The, uh, I know that there's a big pot for Chris Bill and Smith, but Lee Cutler's getting a little bit of love as well uh, from the local crowd. He'll have, a, he'll have a decent bang in here tonight. Yep, Lee Cutler always, you know, brings a decent crowd, and as you can see, they have turned out. And, um, yeah, this is a big opportunity here for Lee Cutler against Kingsley. This is a tough contest, a real 50-50 pick -em. Cutler will go for it, as he always does. You know, he's exciting, he fights with his heart on his sleeve. But he's got a tricky customer here in, in Kingsley. You know, he works his way well behind the ring, yet stylistically, this could be fantastic. Listen to the crowd here as well, all getting behind Lee Cutler, just looking with probably three quarters full already. And um, yeah, expect this one to be a cracker. Ebenike, a very talented boxer. Not necessarily too many knockouts on that resume for Ebenike, but Lee Cutler, a lot of people will remember him from his fight with Brad Ray. He came up short that night, but since he's bounced back well, and tonight he gets the opportunity to get himself a little bit of gold in the shape of the English title. And there you go, he's just been introduced to the crowd, you can hear the pop from them. And they're going to be cheering on the local lad. Hopefully in their eyes, towards some English title victory. Uh, another local lad will be in the ring a little later on, we're going to be doing that on TalkSport. 8.30 is when we cross over to TalkSport for Chris Billum Smith versus Matthias Masternak. So make sure you stick around, but right now it's time to get underway with the first contest of the evening here on TalkSport 2. Lee Cutler taking on Kingsley Ebenike for the Super Welterweight English title. Calling you through that, the one and only Mr Spencer Oliver and the dulcet tones of John Rowling. Thank you, Adam. The two fighters given instructions, centre ring by Steve Gray, now go back to their own corners. This is a ten-rounder, ten three-minute rounds. Second the time. English Super Welterweight title and the action now underway. Egbeniki, tall, fights out of an orthodox stance. He stands around about six feet comes from Acton on the west side of London, Lee Cutler, local lad from Bournemouth, five foot nine, just one defeat. egbenique has been beaten a couple of times, and Cutler has actually been staying in our hotel just down the road from here, and he said to us before he came over, he left the hotel about the same time we did, Spanny. Yeah. He said, say some nice things about me, this is a big one for me, but you can hear from the crowd, terrific atmosphere, a lot of support for Cutler, and I think that a key factor of this is how well Egbeniki handles himself in what is a pretty one-sided crowd, so far as support's concerned. Yep, speaking to Egbeniki the other day, you know, he's a guy that recognises that he's coming into the lion's den, Lee Cutler, he has to cut down the space, we've got a clash of styles here, as in Ebeniki, he will try and keep it long, he'll move around the premier of the ring, as he's doing now, flicking out the jab, jab. it's now, now down to Cutler, to cut down the space, move his feet into range, and let those shots go, he needs to throw the shots, punches in bunches tonight. Mirroring the midway stage of the opening round, and as you'd expect, a fairly quiet opening. Both fighters having a look at each other, trying to work each other out. Egbeniki, as Spencer saying, trying to keep it long, trying to work behind his jab. Cutler ducking low, tries to throw an overhand right and a left hook. Both of them were partially blocked by Egbeniki, who... I think it's fair to say he had a good amateur record and maybe if you were to analyse what he's achieved so far as a professional he's been a little bit of an underachiever. He said that this is a great challenge, he was looking forward to it and that pressure doesn't get to him. Well he's settled quite well in this opening round and he's had a little bit of success with the left jab, no great power shots from Agbaniki but he has managed to find a way through and for the moment the the cipher of support for Cutler is to some extent quiet. There's a couple of decent body shots though, from Cutler. A left hook to the body and a right hand. Probably the first power shots that have been landed. But a nice right hand counter from Egbeniki as Cutler came in trying to follow up on that. And Egbeniki catching him as he came in with a decent right hand. Yep, all warming up really nicely here. Cutler stalking forward, hands held high, trying to close that space. Ebenike working everything behind the jab, spears out the jab again, lands flush in Cutler's face. Good contest this. Styles make fights, and this is going well. Yeah, not a lot between them in this opening round. Maybe Egbeniki has landed the more punches, possibly so. Obviously, the judges who are sitting 
officiating on this one and giving their deliberation on each round, they'll maybe be swayed by the noise from the crowd, which is very much in Cutler's favour. A couple of decent left-hand leads from Agbaniki, and as they come to the end and go back now to their corners, well, I have to say, Spenny, I think I'd give that to the Londoner. I yes. think Agbaniki took that opener. Yeah, John, I'm going to go with you on that one. Very close round, cautious round there from Lee Cutler, stalking forward, looking for that on opportunity, trying to move his feet into range, hands held high, but not letting his shots go enough. Ebaniki was the one that found the range quicker, working the jab, popping out the single jab, double jab, started landing it, landed a couple of good right hands as well. Cutler stalking forward, but not getting off with his shots enough. I'm with you, John Rawling. Ebaniki for me, nicking that first round. Yeah, I think he pinched it, didn't he? I mean, it wasn't emphatic one way or the other. He's known as Obi. Kingsley Agbaniki, and he's normally brought in small venues like the York Hall. He's had plenty of experience there. So coming into a big arena like this one here in Bournemouth, how was he going to be affected by it? And he's settled quite well. Action underway now in the second round. Egbeniki, the taller figure in the blue and white shorts, trying to keep this at range. And Cutler so far not doing particularly well at breaking down that reach advantage from Egbeniki. Stands around five foot nine, Lee Cutler. Been a pro since 2018. His last three wins have come on points. His last in May against Leicestershire's Stanley Stannard. Egbeniki, he's been a pro as well for a few years now, but this is his first title fight, and he picks his punch as well there with a right hand to the body. Good left jab and then switch to the body left jab from Cutler, who has a slight smile on his face. He's one of those boxers who really does appear to enjoy what he's doing in there. Yeah, this is all about opportunity. Let's see how Ebeniki takes that one. Lee Cutler has boxed on that big stage before on the undercards. I saw him here actually in this very arena when the Chris Billum Smith beat Isaac Chamberlain. He was on the undercard of that one. So he knows what this crowd, this atmosphere is all about. Let's see how Ebeniki deals with it. He's boxing really well at the moment again spears out the jab lands that shot well Cutler gets inside but nothing really effective getting off no he's not been able to take advantage yet Josh Pritchard the trainer of Lee Cutler and we'll go into the top of the corner he's got Egbeniki trapped in the corner up in front of him and he's trying to wade in get his head on Egbeniki's chest and land those power hooks which are his trademark but Egbeniki doing a pretty good job of tying him up and nothing too, nothing too emphatic being landed by Cutler despite the pressure there. But you heard straight away the reaction of the crowd and they'll rise to everything he does. The two of them land simultaneously almost with left jabs. Nothing between them, no great power from either man. Yeah, better work there though from Lee Cutler. Pe pinned Ebeniki in that corner, started getting off with those hot right hands. More importantly, close that gap. Ebeniki again spearing out the jab, throws a cross through the middle as well. Trying to keep this long here at the moment, Ebeniki, but Cutler doing better in this second round. Last 40 seconds now of this second round, and remember we gave the opener to Kingsley Ebeniki, the Londoner, but the Bournemouth man is coming on a bit stronger. Lovely uppercut in there, though, from Ebeniki as Cutler tried to unload a chopping right hand. He was greeted on the way in by a right uppercut from Ebeniki. A couple of body shots as well, none and left hand into the body from Cutler, who's staying right on the front foot in the closing seconds of the round. And referee Steve Gray, tall, bearded figure, he warns Cutler about infringements in close. And they come into the last 10 seconds, as you heard, by the wrap on the ring apron. Close round again, but maybe Cutler doing enough to take that one. Yeah. We'll go into the corner now and hear from Cutler's corner. Trainer Josh Pritchard is the voice you'll hear giving instructions to his man. If you just don't do anything in between the exchanges, okay? I want you to be a little bit busier in between. You bust him a few times there, great right hand over the top, and in the inside, just work a little bit more. Okay? Three. Couple of breaths. You look great, you look really comfortable, okay? In between the exchanges, be busier. Fill the gaps, okay? Am I still running the rounds up? Yeah. Faint, don't worry about that, you're building it. You're, you're buzzing him to his boots, even Leave with it. the jab, okay? You're lighting him up, all right? Just start being a little bit busier. Don't load up, just touch the jab and start driving the right hand downstairs, okay? He's really weary of your power. 
right? So just line the shots up. Seconds. And move your head off your chair. So good stuff, mate. Yeah, I think they're fairly happy there. Josh Pritchard, who's Shane McGuigan's number two in that gym. Lee Cutler says that he's learned so much from training alongside Chris Billum Smith. And of course, really welcomed the opportunity to get into that gym and into that training environment. And how well is he rising to the task? Well, at the moment, this fight is very much in the balance as we move into the third. How did you score that second? Yeah, I had Lee Cutler winning that round. He closed the gap a little bit more. He was getting off of the heaviest shots. Mbeki, you know, he didn't really get off of anything particularly well. Throw a little couple of light shots on the inside, but a better round there from Cutler. Good instructions, by the way, in the corner as well, telling him just to stick tight. To look You're busy, to look busy. Absolutely, because you can tell, John, this fight looks like it's going to be one of those that could come down to the wire. Both guys here are going to have to bite down a little bit. Yeah, you suspect that this is going to go long, this fight. And it's Egberniki now, controlling centre ring, trying to work behind the jab as Cutler works inside, tries to get in close, and he's met by a couple of nice body shots from Egberniki. Right hook and a left hook, finishing those at that exchange, and Egberniki getting the better of that. Cutler now onto the front foot, trying to walk his man down, trying to close the gap. Egberniki ducks low and then picks him off with a right-hand counter and a left-hand lead. Nice boxing from the Londoner. Yep, good work there from Ebeniki, just taking that little shuffle back, creating that space, getting through with a good jab and across as well. Not as much work coming here from Cutler as I say that. He goes in with a right hand, just misses with a body shot, but Ebeniki, for me, doing the better work here in the third. Well, Ebeniki has a game plan and he clearly, clearly fancies this one. Cutler's corner saying he's worried about your power. Well, that may well be, but at the moment, Cutler's not getting into range to show anything. He's being picked off at range by Egberniki, who's boxing really well here in this third round. Trench tries to throw a left hand Cutler and another, but he's speared by another good jab from Egberniki, who's boxing very smartly here in the third. Yep, getting into a rhythm here, isn't he? With 50 seconds to go of this third round, Egberniki just taking a little shuffle back, spears out the jab again, lands that shot well. Cutler walking forward, but not hitting the target right now. Good round this from Egberniki as he switches the attack's head and body. And two more good shots to the head, and then a couple of hooks to the body. Good work from Egberniki, who's dominated this third round. If Cutler may have shaded the second. This has been Egberniki quite definitely underlined here in the third as we move into the last 20 seconds. And Cutler tries to close the gap again, tries to walk him into a corner. But Egberniki, showing good footwork, gets out of range, works his way along the ropes, picks his man off with a nice, sweet right hand counter. Then a left lead as well. And this has been a really good round for the Londoner. And Lee Cutler has to do rather better. Let's hear what Gary. Davis makes of this. Well, I thought, I agree, I think Ebeniki had a fantastic round there. He was controlling it from the long range and the mid range. But what Cutler's not doing, which we did in the, he did in the first two rounds, was sliding, you going, changing levels from the waist, sliding under the jab and closing the distance. Because he's a pressure fighter. And yet the pressure's on him now. Big round for Ebeniki. Yeah, Ebeniki was the one that got into a rhythm. He started oozing confidence from the second half of that third round you could see him sliding slipping you could see the confidence growing in him and lee cutler actually you could see him sort of you know that you could see the confidence draining out of him he was stalking forward gareth a davis was writing what he says lack of head movement started getting picked off with the jabs cutler needs to change this around now because ebeniki is oozing confidence right now first round was close we edged it to ebeniki second round we gave to cutler third round to Egberniki. We now move into the fourth of this ten rounder and Lee Cutler needs a good round here because as you heard Egberniki starting to get into a rhythm in the third. Good footwork and again skips away from a lunging attack from Cutler who's not really putting combinations together and okay when he gets into range he does throw shots menacingly but he's not doing too much in between and he's finding it difficult to narrow that gap and to actually get in close where he's most effective yep Cutler needs to take the play away here he's the aggressor he needs to come forward he needs to move that, those feet 
in range and more importantly needs to let his hands go punches in bunches at the moment single jab just misses there Ebeniki again double jab right hand good work again from Ebeniki oh lovely work fast hands and he nails Cutler several times with straight shots but then gets back and Cutler with a solid left hook to the head and that hook to the body, that's better from Cutler, he needed to rally and that's the first decent shots he's thrown for some time Agbaniki back on his bike and he's caught by another right hand from Cutler, who's looking very much stronger here, those shots found the mark and Agbaniki felt the power and suddenly the spring is starting to go out of his footwork, another right hand from Cutler and Cutler having a very much better spell yeah, Cutler needed to turn the screw, and that's exactly what he's done. Good right hands, body shot, goes in as well. Referee Steve Gray breaks them up, tells him to keep them up. But I didn't think that was bad from Cutler there. He's having a good round. He told Cutler to keep his shots up. There was a left hand which may have strayed low. Agbaniki now back up, standing tall. He throws that jab from very low by his left side, and Cutler is looking for that overhand right, that right hand into the side of the Agbaniki head. He recognises that that's a potential opening. I don't think he'd seen and studied too much of Agbaniki. He's learning in there. A couple of jabs now from the Londoner, both scoring shots, and another one. And then a sweet right hand as well, as Cutler just takes them. They bounce off him. He's clearly got a good chin, Lee Cutler. Only the one defeat on his record, and he knows that this, in a lot of ways, is mainly, maybe, a bit of a world title-style opportunity for Kingsley Agbaniki. He knows that, and he knows that he's going to have to rally, and he's going to have to go with this guy when he puts the pressure off. Yep, John, listen, this is all about opportunity, and this is a huge one for both of these guys. You know, the winner kicks on, he looks at British titles and moves on from there. The loser has to pick up the pieces. It's it's not an easy road back. As I say that, both guys training blow for blow. Good round, close round. Last Good few right seconds of this round, right hand from Butler, and then a straight left as well. And Ekbeniki goes back to his corner. Started the round really well, but Cutler came on strong and had a dominant spell midway in that fourth round. And for me, I think that did enough to win him the round. Yeah, totally agree, John. It was that 30-second spell that he had there. He turned the screw when he needed to. He couldn't allow Ebeniki to start building the ground, picking up the rounds. He needed to change things, and that's exactly what he done. Good left hook to the body, followed up by a good right hand to the head. Then he picked it up again, went phase one, phase two, and that's exactly what Cutler needed. Four rounds down, two rounds apiece on my scorecard, very close here. He's looking as though he's forced his way right back into it there. A lot of interest, people watching at ringside, including Kel Brook. The world welterweight champion from 2014 to 2017. And don't forget, by the way, you can watch along with us over on Talk Sport Boxing YouTube channel. Head over there right now to follow the action with us as it happens. English super welterweight title, Lee Cutler against Kingsley Egbeniki going into the fifth round, and we've got it level. Yep, nothing in this at all. And this is the pattern of the fight now, Ebeniki working on the outside, trying to keep the space, pushes out the jab, doubles up the jab, sends a sweat spraying from Cutler's face. Cutler stalking forward, hands held high, trying to get on the inside. And he's got to try and get in there, and when he does get in there, throw some power shots to take the spring out of Egbenike's legs, which he managed in the last round, but Egbenike's recovered well, and he's now looking as though he's a bit more back into the groove that served him well in the third round, when he dominated, but here comes Cutler, narrows the gap, brings the shot up, catches Egbenike, a glancing blow on the chin, Egbenike wants to stand and trade, and he's caught by an overhand right from Cutler, and that's a good spell from the Bournemouth man. Yeah, Ebeniki deciding to roll the dice a little bit here. Got hit with a good left hook to the body. Brought the arms down and he's decided to stand. Trade, he's mixing it in the centre of the ring. Right hand comes in and Ebeniki's legs look shaky. Well, I don't, I'm not sure about these tactics that Ebeniki's employing here. Maybe he's been forced to stand and trade. Maybe the, the nimble fleet-footedness of the early rounds has now starting to elude him because Cutler's narrowing the gap. 
and starting to land bigger shots. And Egbeniki, for me, doesn't look as though he's 100% in there now. These blows from Cutler taking a toll. Lands the right hand. He has Egbeniki in the corner on the far side of the ring. Really trying to work Hepping close, right in the pocket. And a smile across the ring to his promoter because Cutler knows that things are now starting to go his way. Although he's caught by a right uppercut on the way in from Egbeniki. But Egbeniki, not a power puncher. And when they get into exchange at toe to toe like now, you sense that Cutler is the man with the power. Yeah, Egbeniki starting to look tired. There's a tired look on his face as he lies on the ropes. Cutler working the body well, chopping the right hands in as well. And there's a sorry look about Egbeniki at the moment. He's trying to bite down on his gum shield. Uppercut, right hand. But Lee Cutler's not giving him any space. Not a good uppercut though inside there from Egbeniki. And now the fight really is warming up as they near the halfway stage. It's a 10 rounder, and the two of them right together, toe to toe on the far side. Egbeniki tries to throw a couple of hooks. Back comes Cutler with one of his own. Referee Steve Gray keeping a very close look, looking to make sure that everything's legal in there. It's the sort of fight which once upon a time when there used to be phone boxes that say it could have been staged in there. Two of them land solid shots. And it's a big shot from Cutler in the last few seconds of the round. And Cutler going really well. Barry and Shane McGuigan sitting at ringside, giving him their support. And he'll be delighted with what he's seen there. We'll go into the blue corner now Lowering. and hear what's going on in the Kingsley Egbeniki coaching staff. Listen, if he's lifting that elbow, I want you to lift that elbow straight back on it. You understand me? Don't let him get away with that shit. The shift is working nicely, you just got letting the backhand go. Jab, shift, backhand, shift, back on the jab. Make it easy as possible for yourself. Alright? When you're in there, short, short, finish down to the body. Well, apologies Wait. about some of the language you might have heard in the corner. And there were, of course, emotions running high. I thought Lee Cutler won that last round. Spenny, would you agree with that? Yeah, well, with you, John Cutler had a good spell there towards the end and landed a big right hand right on the bell there as well. Steve Gray just pulled them together, told them to keep it clean. Ebeniki starting straight away, trying to keep that distance. Cutler misses by a cat's whisker with that right hand. And now he's trying to get onto the front foot again, trying to put pressure on Egbeniki, and you heard from his corner saying, just keep him away, keep your form, keep your style, keep your shape, and don't let him get in close and start landing with hooks and indeed throwing maybe the odd elbow in there as well. A couple of jabs from Egbeniki, then a left hand to the body from Cutler. Good work from Egbeniki. A couple of solid shots to the head. Incidentally, we could told by the viewers who are watching on television that Cutler on the viewers' cards has it slightly more clearly than we do. We beg to differ. We have it 3-2 to two in Cutler's favour. That was at the halfway stage. We're now in the sixth round of this 10-rounder. Yeah, very tough fight. It's starting to become very gruelling now. We've got the boxer versus the brawler. The brawler being Lee Cutler. He's the one stalking forward, trying to close the gap, trying to work on the inside. That's where he's picking up set. success. Ebeniki trying to keep it long. John Nash where he's successful with those long jabs a couple of combinations going in as well interesting this it's all going to become psychological going on here and just over a minute and a half to go in the sixth round Egbenik has started the round well as he has done in previous rounds keeping it long working behind that jab but no great power shots coming from Egbeniki and the eye-catching shots, the point-scoring shots you sense are still coming from Cutler and now he gets in closer and he's trying to get an opportunity to ram some hooks like that left hand which thuds into the side of the head of Egbeniki and then a lovely right uppercut inside again from Cutler and a right cross, left hook, right hand all to the head of Egbeniki who's having to dig really deep here he was shaken down to his boots by that combination by that plethora of real power headshots and Egbeniki now is struggling to keep his man off yet yeah, big setback goal of there, there from Ebeniki as I say that Cutler right hand lands on the side of Ebeniki's head again 
there's a desperate look again here, a tired look about Ebeniki and Cutler growing in confidence, oozing in confidence. And he certainly had his best attack for some time earlier in this round. 30 seconds to go in this sixth round. And he's right in the face of Egbeniki now, leaning on, and the referee splits them, and the action underway again. Egbeniki with King around his waistband. Cutler in the green and white shorts has his own name on his waistband. Cutler, and now here he comes, landing some power shots in the corner on the far side in the Egbeniki corner. Strong finish to the round from Lee Cutler. Let's hear from Adam and Gareth how they're singing. I don't understand what Egbeniki's doing here. He looks really good at range, he looks really good when he keeps it long, and he keeps getting dragged into Lee Cutler's fight. Lee Cutler wants the pressure, he wants to be up close and personal, he wants to be exchanging, and when he is exchanging, he's getting the better of Egbeniki. This is not the fight Egbeniki needs to be fighting, mate. He needs to get on that back foot. The first half of that round, Egbeniki was listening to his corner, who was at range, winning the fight, winning the fight, winning the round. But you cannot hold off a tenacious pressure fighter like Cutler if you don't hurt him at all and he hasn't hurt him at all in this fight I've got it 4-2 now for Cutler I tell you what the crowd behind us on that bank are going crazy it's a great atmosphere what an exhausting grueling fight this is becoming Spencer. it certainly is and John Rawling just hit the nail on the head he, the, 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 the plain and simple fact of this is that Ebeniki doesn't have the strength to keep Cutler off, and that's why he's starting the rounds well. And as the round wears on, Cutler's walling forward, using that strength. Here we go, start of round seven. Let's see if the pattern's the same. Egbeniki backpedaling as Cutler comes forward, trying to walk him down into range. Egbeniki moving along the ropes, out of harm's range, and does get a left hand in, but then back comes Cutler, and he's just getting into these rounds a little bit earlier now. Lands a good body shot and two right hands to the head. Back comes Egbeniki off the ropes. A couple of decent shots from him, including a nice looking right uppercut, but another right hand from Cutler, who's got that marauding sort of style. Might not be quite sort of Barry McGuigan, but those who remember McGuigan as a fighter, and he's sitting watching at ringside tonight. That was all about him. Work rate and a huge number of hooks thrown, and he's trying to do precisely that, Lee Cutler. Yeah, working he's... away in close now, and he tries to fight off the road. Ebeniki, but again he's not got the power to push his man back yep totally agree with that John there is a severe pressure coming in here from Lee Cutler he's got Ebeniki on the ropes pinned above us Ebeniki tired look about his work now the jab not having the same effect as it did in the earlier rounds Cutler driving those body shots in big right hand as well and another one and Ebeniki on the ropes there's no Fast footwork now, he's having to absorb these shots. Right hand, left hand from Cutler, both scoring shots. Egbeniki tries to tie him up, tries to spoil and tries to give himself some space. And now he has got that space, but he doesn't land punches when he's got space to do so. And forward comes Cutler once more. Egbeniki forced to try and rally off the ropes, but it's Cutler who's dominating. Yep, minute left in the seventh round, and Ebeniki now, their legs are not taking him like they was in the earlier rounds, he's pinned on the ropes, the same spot he's been for the last minute or so, as I say that, Cutler drives in a left hook, right hook to the body, Ebeniki looking tired here, he needs to find the second win. A little bit of grazing and marking around the corner of the eyes of Lee Cutler, but it's nothing serious, it's not affecting him. Good jab there from Egbeniki, who all the time is trying to fire well as he backpedals. Lands a, a right hand counter, but it just bounces off the head of Lee Cutler, who again now is right in the face of Egbeniki in the Egbeniki corner on the far side of the ring. The crowd roaring Cutler on. Egbeniki getting a bit of success coming off those ropes there. Last 10 seconds of the round, but it's Cutler who finishes as the aggressor and the crowd rising to him. To Terrific action as they go absolutely toe to toe, and that was a hard round to score. But for me, I think Cutler probably edged it again. Yeah, I'm with you, John Cutler. For me, doing the better work in the second half of the round. There, Ebeniki was pinned on the ropes, couldn't move. The legs weren't moving him like they were in the earlier rounds. The jab was not as effective as it was in the earlier rounds. Now Lee Cutler is using his brute strength 
He's getting in range. He's chopping down with the right hands. The left hooks are landing as well. This is becoming difficult now for Ebeniki. Lee Cutler for me. After seven rounds, I've got him three rounds up. Ebeniki, really, John, for me, needs to roll the dice. He needs to do something here because this fight is slipping away from him. You're listening to boxing here on Talk Sport 2. English super welterweight title. Lee Cutler from Bournemouth against Sexley Ebeniki. Paul Londoner from Acton, the main event of the night, which is the WBO Cruiserweight title. Chris Billum Smith defending against Matthias Masternak. That comes up on Talk Sport later on this evening. We'll be switching at about half past eight, so be sure to join us then. Got some terrific boxing action for you coming up as the evening unfolds, including the fifth professional appearance of the hugely talented light heavyweight. Ben Whitaker, Olympic silver medalist in action here again tonight. Yep, really looking forward to that. Also, Olympic gold medalist Lauren Price in action as well. Tremendous night ahead of us, but we've got a great fight going on here as well. Round eight, Lee Cutler versus uh, Kingsley Ebeniki, and Ebeniki now starting to find things a little, bo little bit difficult. We're not seeing the same effects with the jab. He's not throwing it enough, and Cutler just has a stronger more rounded look about him at the moment. Well, on my card, I tell you what, I think Egbenik has got to win all the rounds here to have a chance, and he's got to dominate from here on in. And I think more than just picking off the occasion, pitter patter punch, he's got to land some real telling blows. Lands a left to the body, and then a left to the head now. Tries to throw another one, and Cutler saw it coming, and is able to block him and walks him down towards the ropes backing him up towards his own corner where Cutler's had some of his best moments in this fight and you suspect that he must surely know that he's ahead at this stage of course it depends how the judges score it it's how they see it it's just how we see it that Cutler's ahead but we've got it by about three rounds but Egbeniki may be just edging the first minute and a half of this round no great power punches but he's just able to pick Cutler off once or twice at range as Cutler comes in close. Yep, the, 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 the round has slowed in pace actually in this round. Cutler stalking forward, not the same volume of punches and Ebeniki is happy to take his foot off the gas as well. Quiet around here from both guys and Ebeniki doing well, manoeuvring on the perimeter of the ring, missing the shots. Cutler still stalking forward, misses with a jab. Ebeniki switching from left to right. Big jab there from Ebeniki followed by a right hand. And he turned it well and he's and worked really well there. Good footwork from Ekbeniki. Turned him around and landed telling shots. I wondered whether Lee Cutler had deliberately taken his foot off the gas in this round. Or maybe it's more of a case that he's the one who's gassing. And Ekbeniki is having a very much better round here in this eighth. And there's not been too much of note from Cutler. Last 20 seconds now of this eighth round. Cutler leans on close, tries to work inside, but the referee has to split them. Egbeniki aims to pick him off with a right uppercut, but then lands with a left-hand lead. And this is good from Egbeniki. Boxed very much how his corner would have wished. And it's going to be interesting to see how Cutler rallies from this, because that was a clear Egbeniki round. Let's go to the Cutler corner now and hear from his trainer, Josh Britton. Okay, he's trying to pull you around and do nothing just to get through this fight. Okay, step in on him. Two more now, isn't there? Two more. Yeah. Step in on him now. Okay? Lee, you've got the gears in you, mate. You're fit as a flea, mate. Yeah. A solid six minutes. Put it in. Okay? Push the place, take your hands high, slip in and work. He's he wants to get out. Yeah. He's trying to kill the clock. Okay? I still won that round though, didn't I? Yes. All right, Lee, don't punch him too far out. That's his only chance of working when you overreach and then he jumps in with a little burst, okay? Yeah. Step first, get close to him, okay? Slip in, work his body, okay? That body shot off in He needs a good six minutes, that's what they've told him. Meanwhile, Egbeniki will have been told exactly the same. He's got to go out and win these last two rounds. 
the gap though closed in the last. Yeah, Ebeniki looked like he got that second win. That's what happens to a fighter. We go back a couple of rounds and he looked like he'd blown a gasket. He was sitting on the ropes, looking very tired, very sorry for himself. But Cutler gave him the space in that round and Ebeniki, he took that and he, he, he grew in confidence. Let's see what happens here at the beginning of the night. Ebeniki with his back towards us in those blue and white shorts and his surely got to win these last two rounds and has a chance here and has a good solid shot and the oohs and ahs from around the crowd they're absolutely with the local hero lee cutler here but he's having a little bit of a tough time in the closing rounds of this fight egbeniki always looked tremendously fit didn't he when he came to the ring looks in phenomenal shape and maybe as the finishing line comes closer maybe he's the stronger a couple of good body shots from Egbeniki and not a lot from Cutler in the opening minutes of this night yet yeah, we've seen a little change in the pattern here actually Lee Cutler's now the one that's looking the more tired of the two he's stalking forward not throwing the shots just missed with a big right hand and Ebeniki has slipped into a little river Egbeniki's mouth though is starting to show bruising the bottom lip is cut as well and surely Lee Cutler will see that one Cutler now trying to walk him down and he lands a right hand right into the mouth the open mouth of Egbeniki and a left jab and another one this is the reaction of the crowd when Cutler lands and he lands again and this time Egbeniki goes down but it's not given us a knockdown He's sent to a neutral corner, Lee Cutler, and the referee giving him time, not giving us a knockdown. How did you read that one, Spencer? Yeah, there was a, just a, a, there was a little slip of the footing there, and Evan Eke, and I don't think there was a shot landed, and he went down, but there was a tired look about him, and there now seems to be a change in the tide again here, with Cutler up on his toes. Evan Eke comes back with some good shots. Well, I've got to tell you, John Rawling, here in the ninth round, I think the fight is all to fight for. Cutler slightly in front, but Evan Eke, he's still in this. Some of these English title fights and British titles produce the very best of action and you're hearing some good action here on talk sport 2 this english super welterweight contest and cutler sways this way and that tries to get into range jake baniki back pedaling no punches being landed at the moment but then forward comes cutler lands the right hand over the top landed on the side of the head of Egbeniki and another one good work from Cutler starting to unload Egbeniki needs to hold on needs to buy a bit of time last 10 seconds of the round and Cutler finishing it really strongly another big right hand referee watching closely he'll not want to see too many more and Egbeniki looks dog tired as he goes back to the corner and Cutler is on the verge of victory Adam that last 30 seconds might just have sealed him that round. I thought Egbeniki was looking really good on the back foot, pivoting off that front foot. He's creating angles beautifully in these last couple of rounds. But that little onslaught from Lee Cutler might just be giving him his sixth round there. And Egbeniki needs now something really special in this last three minutes if he's going to haul himself back into this English title. Completely concur with you, Adam. Egbeniki needs a massive round. Cutler's... It's all about the will now of Cutler to take that 10th round. Maybe, we were talking about women's three minutes round, maybe these should be 12 round fights, not 10 round fights. I could see three more rounds of this. Well, yeah, absolutely. This seconds. has been a very entertaining fight. Both guys have had their successes. Lee Cutler for me, though, for three rounds up going into this 10th and final round. Ebeniki needs to do something big. Has he got the power? Let's see. Ebeniki looked a little bit unsteady as he got off his stool. Now the action underway, the two, as is tradition, touched gloves before it got underway. Egbeniki's got to win this last round big to have any chance, and it may well be that he's going to have to stop Lee Cutler, and that doesn't look as though it's going to happen. We've got it definitely to Cutler at this stage. They come to the last round, right hand to the body, first scoring shot from Cutler, and then a right over the top into the side of the head of Egbeniki. Egbeniki pinned by a left jab and another one good work from Cutler big body shot as well solid left hook 
power shot, and that's going to sap the energy yet more from Egbeniki, who's really doing nothing, not, not a lot more than just trying to find a way to survive here. Doesn't look as though he's got the power to really put a dent in Cutler, and that's what he's going to have to do. Yeah, Cutler's still coming forward here. It is a big finish, big push here in this 10th and final round. You know, he's a few rounds up, but he'll feel that he's close and he'll want to seal the deal here, and he's doing just that. Good left hook standing to the body. Ebeneke, Ebeneke looking tired, left hand down by his waist. Cutler stalking forward. Cutler on our card is clearly ahead in this fight. The born the player. Good work, though, from Ebeneke. Working behind that left hand lead, and then a nice right uppercut as well. Good work, he's left little spell in this fight for some time, Agbaniki. Putting a real big effort here in this in this 10th round, and he's cut Cutler over the left eye. Blood flowing down into that left eye, and Agbaniki is really powering on the pressure. Right hand lands right on the damaged eye, and another one. And this is not good for Cutler. Agbaniki is making a big rally in this last round. Yeah, out of nowhere, Ebeniki's come on here. He's cut Lee Cutler over the left eye. He's bleeding quite badly. Ebeniki senses he could get the finish here in this 10th and final round. Big pressure, big dramas here. But you suspect too much, too little, too late from Ebeniki. And he's put a lot in there now. And as he just punched himself out for the moment, as here comes Cutler again. Big right hand on the level another over the top and Egbeniki holds on and wants to buy precious seconds as we move now towards the last 30. Egbeniki who started pretty well in this contest maybe took two of the first three rounds but the strength and the power of Cutler has worn his man down as the fight has unfolded. Been a good right a good last round though from Egbeniki another right hand and another into the head of Cutler who's having to dig deep into the last 10 seconds. Tremendous effort from Agbaniki. Right up the cut from Cutler. And the crowd's rising to him. What a great round. Great last round. Cutler finishes as the aggressor. And he's taken off his opponent by the referee. Back to his corner. He's onto the ropes. Celebrating. Waving to the crowd. Agbaniki, meanwhile, is being chaired around the ring. His corner also think that Herman has won, but for me, Lee Cutler is surely the winner and will be crowned the new English super welterweight champ. Well, what a fight that was. That's what boxing is all about, opportunity. Both guys saw that as an opportunity, and they both went for it. They both rolled the dice there in that 10th and top final round. Every round was entertaining. For me, Lee Cutler, the extra strength, he was bullish in there, and I think that's what got him over the line. The better boxing skills were coming from Ebeniki, but I think he lacked the power. He sat on the ropes a little too much, but I've got to say, what a contest. English super welterweight fight, and that is what it's all about. I've got him taking two of the last three rounds, Ebeniki, which sort of dragged him back into the contest, and just looking at the way we scored it, and uh, Spen is giving uh, the last round level. I thought Lee Cutler maybe was beaten in that last round. I think it might have been a 10-9 to Egbeniki. On my card, I've got it Cutler 6-4, maybe 7-3 but I've got Cutler ahead and, and a winner. Yeah, I won with you. I've got Cutler winning that one by two. John, I actually did have Ebeniki. Sorry, terrible writing there, my friend. I actually did have Ebeniki winning that for final round. 10-9, big finish. Cutler looked tired. He got cut. You know, he had to bite down on his gum shield. That's what it's all about. But Cutler, for me, holding on, hanging on, and going out a deserved winner there. But what a performance by Ebeniki. I tell you what, boys. I wouldn't mind seeing that again. Really good entertaining fight and an anxious wait for both men now as the cards are tallied. I think Big Mo has got the all-important piece of paper in there. The English welterweight belt is being taken up into the ring and Steve Gray in a moment will draw the two fighters together. Lee Cutler getting a, a bit of work on that damaged left eye. They're going to need some, some stitches in that. There's a really ugly gash underneath his uh, left eyebrow and he not surprisingly struggled in the closing stages there. Egbeniki really inspired in those last three minutes but the two fighters now are being told to come centre ring by the referee 
and in a moment or two we'll hear Big Mo deliver the verdict and for us it's going to go to Lee Cutler whether or not the judges are going to agree well we'll find out very soon I have to say as well that fight was fought in a really good spirit yep it certainly was you know both guys showing that respect ultimate gladiatorial sport and they showed that, that, that respect to each other a great moment that only them two have shared we're just about to get that announcement Jumbo the cut man holding ladies and gentlemen after 10 full championship rounds we go to the judges scorecards for the official decision judge John Latham sees the contest 96 to 95 while judges Lee Every and Reese Carter see it 97 to 93 declaring your winner by unanimous decision and the new English super welterweight champion Lee Can't really disagree with those judges' scorecards. Seven, three, or six, four, in favour of Lee Cutler. Great performance from him. Rallied really well in those centre rounds and hung on at the end as Evaniki fouled it on. He is the new English Super Welterweight Champion. Congratulations to him. I'm sure the people of Portsmouth will help him celebrate at some point this evening. And still to come this evening, we've got another local boy in action as he defends his world title. Chris Billum Smith in the cruiserweight division taking on Matthias Masternak. We've also got a couple of Olympians coming up very, very shortly here on Talk Sport 2. You're listening to Fight Night live from Bournemouth.
We're in Bournemouth at the International Centre tonight. World Championship action as Chris Billum Smith defends in the Cruiserweight division against Matthias Masternak. Before it, though, here on TalkSport 2, we are going to be bringing you uh, a couple of Olympians. Uh, first up will be Lauren Price, who has impressed us immensely since she turned over as a professional. Spencer, and there's hot talk on maybe in 2024 that this young lady will be challenging for world title honours. Absolutely, listen, we see the women, you know, moving on a lot faster. There's not the same volume of fighters out there, so the girls do kick on faster. And you know, Lauren Price now 5-0, and Olympic gold medalist. You would expect her to be making that jump in 2024. You know, there's some big fights out there for her. Natasha Jonas goes against Michaela Meyer on January the 20th. You know, she'll be looking at the winner of that or somewhere in and around that sort of place so that's where she's at Lauren Price you know it's all about you know it's all about that development and getting used to the professional ring that transition from amateur to professional boxing etc and she's done that brilliantly you know she's got incredible hand speed she's got great awareness great, great control she t controls the space very well as well quite exciting to watch you know throws her punches in bunches looking forward to her to kick on she will for me definitely go on and win a world title. She's in the mix there. She can be up with your Michaela Myers. She can be up with, you know, Natasha Jonas, those sort of fighters within the next six to 12 months. With them all being under the same umbrella and the same promoter and obviously on the same broadcaster, it does make it slightly easier to try and make those fights happen. I'm just trying to think at the stage of their careers, in particular Natasha Jonas, would that be something that Natasha Jonas would want to do with uh, Lauren Price? Or is Natasha Jonas looking at maybe unifying divisions, even stepping down in weight once again to maybe head towards something like a Chantel Cameron or a Katie Taylor or those types of characters? Absolutely. Listen, Tash has, um, has made that quite clear. You know, she'd love Chantel Cameron, Katie Taylor. Or, you know, if they go again, if they get that trilogy fight on, you know, Natasha Jonas, they're the sort of fights. But what I love about this is that the politics don't get in the way too much. The girls, they all want to fight each other. They're yeah. jumping up and down through the weights. And that's because, like I said, there's not the same volume of fighters up there. And, you know, when you get to elite level, world title level, or there or thereabouts, there's some quality operators. There really is. And the girls love a challenge. You know, they do that. I think the turning point for women's boxing and when it really evolved, you know, when we go back to the O2, when Clarissa Shields took on uh, our own Savannah Marshall there, you know, the, the, that show was cancelled six weeks before due to the passing of the Queen. The girls all come back. We've got every single fight on there. 20,000 packed out arena, 2 million watching it on Sky. And I think that was the term and turning point for women's boxing. But what we saw there was, you know, that they like to take on each other. Uh, well, we're going to have Lauren Price in the ring very, very shortly. One man that's going to be observing that is the one and only Mr. Harry Redknapp, who is with Gareth A. Davis. Now, the last time we were at Chris Billum Smith winning the world title, you said you might have a bit of a dance with someone. Graham Souness was there. I tried to get you in the ring together for a charity fight. What happened? Oh, no, I can't fight. No. You ca you could when you were younger. Yeah, but I'm a... Uh, yeah, I, I, I nearly say I'm a better runner, but no, I can't run now. That's for sure either. So, uh, no, I, I just like watching it. I love the boxing. I'm a great boxing fan. And uh, what these guys do, the way they train, how fit they are, it's just amazing. How good was that last fight? Ten three-minute rounds of a torrid war for the English Super Welterweight title. It, it was a proper fight, wasn't it? Do you know, funny enough, before I came out tonight, I had Agler and Tommy Hearns was on. I mean, that was incredible. Wasn't Eight it? minutes of mayhem. Seven and a half minutes of mayhem. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. What, what, what divisions there were then? Sugar Ray, you know, just uh, unbelievable. Uh, so many great fighters around it's been a good weekend for Bournemouth so far, isn't it? 3 0 up in the north. Yeah. Um, the troops coming back after the victory over Man United. Lee Cutler, Bournemouth guy, winning the British, uh, the English title yeah. just now. Um, what's the What's the mood like? This, I think it's the fourth or fifth event, event down here now. It's going balmy in the Bay of Bournemouth for boxing at the moment. Yeah. It's growing, isn't it? Well, the sport is here. Yeah, we're in a high down here for sport. The football team are doing great and. We've finally got boxing here now, we've got a world champion, so we want it to continue. Let's hope Chris can win again tonight and uh, we can get more fights here because I think everybody's loving it. I don't know if you've looked at Mateusz Masternak at all, Harry, but he's a very tough guy. It's his first world title. He's only lost to Bellew and Uniel Dortikos at world level, so 
Chris has got a tough fight ahead of him. It sounds like it's going to be a tough fight, yeah. But, uh, but uh, yeah, we keep our fingers crossed that Chris can do it and retain the title. That would be fantastic. You say you're too old to to, uh, to fight, but I know that you used to run in your hobnail boots, and you, I think you were the London Schools champion at one point. Am I right? It, it was what, sorry? London Schools champion in hobnail boots, oh, weren't you? 400 metres or whatever East it was. London, yeah, East London boys and all that, the boxing. Yeah, we had to box at school. The school I went to, everybody... We had house boxing uh, every month, you know, different house boxing. Then you went and boxed in the East London Championship, so boxing was a big part of this. What was your style? Uh, I was a bit like a man called Dick McTaggart. You, it was before you... He would, like, jab and move, jab and move, keep... Bang, long, long jab, long jab, just jab and move. Hit and not be hit. Don't get hit. No, 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 I didn't like getting hit. Show me someone who likes getting hit, I'll show you a fool. Uh, final thing, Spencer Oliver now does sea swimming in the mornings when yes. he's down here. Do you do that or not? Yes, yes. I didn't do it this morning. I must have. I, we dragged Spencer down there this morning. We got him in, but I actually sat in the cab having a coffee watching him. But he was okay. He went in, and uh, I think he felt good for it. That's uh, back to Spencer and Adam. That's what I'm going to do tomorrow morning because they're trying to get me and my budgie smugglers yeah. in the sea in the morning. I'm going to sit in the cafe yeah. with <laughs> Harry having a coffee and an English breakfast while you guys swim again. Thank I'll you so much, Lord Retnap. I'll meet you there in the morning. I'll be there having a coffee with you. Lovely. Thank you, Lord Retnap. Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Listen, uh, Harry was down there with us today. I nearly got him in, right? So I was with Mark, he's, uh, he's other, uh, his son, Lovely. yesterday. We yeah. was there. We were talking about going down there. I didn't know if it, you know, if it, would, if it would come to life. I didn't know if it would happen. We was in the bar. We were having a good time. Mark does it every day, Mark does it every day, sir. Mark does it every day, but I still didn't think, you know, I didn't know that it was going to happen. 7.30 this morning, the phone pings. Yeah. I look on it. Mark, Spence, are we going? <laughs> I'll pick you up in half hour. So I'm thinking, all right, uh, let's do it. Let's get out there. Got out there. A little bit cold. Meet Harry down there. I said, Harry, you coming in? You going to do it? He went, well, Spence, I've done it a few times. You know, the old ticker, I don't know if it's going to hold up in there. It is a little bit yeah, cold no. in there. Anyway, Harry goes in for the coffee. Me and Mark go in there. And, um, oh, mate, yeah, I've got to tell you. Do you know what the worst part about it was? That you were on the no, I went down there, <laughs> I had, me, had me little shorts on, you know, I had me little shorts on, yep. I braved it. It was walking in, when you first walked into the sea, that first bit, your feet went like ice blocks. And so Mark's going in there, because he does it every day, he's strolling in, he's walking in mate, very slowly. you've got to sprint it. So, you've got it, Catman, you've got it, mate. that's the only way. So I'm looking at him, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this politely, because that's what I've got to do on it. Yep. I'm looking at him going... Come on, mate, speed up a little bit, because I want to dive in and get out. But it was a slow, punishing, gruelling sort of entry into the water. Anyway, we've done it, dived in, out there, went up, coughing with Harry Redknapp, telling us all the stories, you know, football stories, boxing stories, how good it was actually to have boxing down here, you know, in, in, in Bournemouth. You've got to go back to the days of Freddie Mills, you know, for the, you know, the last yeah. good boxer to come from Bournemouth. So, you know, this is brilliant that we've got boxing on the map down here. Long may it continue. We've just seen a great contest there. Lee Cutler-Brick picking up the English Super Welterweight title. You know, and if we can keep churning out fighters like that, we get a chance to keep coming back down here. <laughs> I love this place. And you get you get the opportunity to keep having a dip in that seat at 8 o'clock in the morning. Oh, but, well, by the way, boys, we are in, you in the reckon? morning. Oh, absolutely. Listen, train's not until at least half nine. Down there, <laughs> eight o'clock, in we go. <laughs> Bringing old Adam Reed down there with us as well. We get him in there as well. Full squad. Full squad's going to be in that seat early doors in the morning. Just a quick one on that before we get into our next fight. It's so important having local heroes fighting in local areas, isn't it? I mean, I'm lucky enough to have grown up in an area where we had Ricky Hatton through uh, the early 2000s, late 90s and early 2000s, and there was nothing better than having him fight in Manchester. To have Chris Billum Smith, world champion, fighting in his local area, it doesn't have make the town boom when something like that's happening. Oh, listen, Catman, I've been down there, as you know, all week, and there's been a real buzz about the place. Yes, it's silly season. Yes, it's Christmas season. But everybody down here loves their boxing. And guess what? They love Chris Benham Smith, the gentleman. That's what he calls himself, and that's exactly what he is. He's got the time of day for everyone. Take a look around this big arena. Have a look at it. Look at the atmosphere in here. There's not an empty seat in the place. They love him down here, and they also love their boxing. It's good to have it back here. Mate, on a Sunday as well, eh?
Long may it that was, the, that was the weird thing, by the way. Mm. Leaving the hotel today, I had a roast before I left the hotel <laughs> to come here. You know what? You've had a right there, son. You've been in the sea, you've had a roast dinner, <laughs> you're at the box That's on the Sunday. So hold on, get this here. So you go, 8 a.m., you're in the sea, yeah? You're having a swim. Then you have your roast. Once you have your roast, what happens after you have a roast? You want a kip, don't you? That's it. No, we're here. We're in the Beck Arena, WBO it. Cruiserweight World Title. It. And now looking forward here to Lauren Price entering the ring, Olympic gold medalist. Absolutely. There ain't no sleeping on any of this. Uh, Lauren Price making her way to the ring. We've got Ben Whitaker on the way, and of course, that world title fight a little later on. Uh, just a quick one for you next Friday with an exciting event happening live on TalkSport. It's all in partnership uh, with TalkSport Football Trivia Board Game. AM TalkSport's finest take to the hockey to battle it out to be crowned the inaugural TSD World Darts Champion. Join Paul Hawksby and Andy Jacobs from 1 o'clock for all the action anchored by our very own Jim White. Adrian Dunham and Darren Bent will be taking all the fallout from 4 on drive. Don't just listen to the action on TalkSport. You can watch it live unfold on the TalkSport YouTube channel. Uh, that's next Friday from 1 o'clock. And I believe, Spencer Oliver, you have been drawn uh, in there uh, with a very, very tough first round darts match. I'm, I'm not so sure it's a tough match, if I'm totally honest. I'm sort of, you know, quietly confident about this situation. Darren Bent, great footballer. Is he a good dart player? I'm not so sure he is. Actually... I'm starting to feel that like I'm in his head already. I think I'm living rent-free right now. We've had the conversation. I've been on drive. I've talked to him. I think I've psychologically done him already. Is he, flapping? Is he flapping already? Well, he's not flapping, but you know when you can hear a break in the voice. You yeah. know, there's a, there's a little, yeah, there's a little crack in the tone. Let's just say that. Let's, let's just say there, you know. Have you, uh, are you going with the old walkout music? They all have walkout music for the dogs, mate, don't they? I, I, mate, I've got the jacket, yeah. It's got the omen written on the back. For people that don't know, that was my boxing name. I've got the darts. I've got the darts, mate. Do you know the old 22-gram darts? The ones that stick in the dark. Listen, and I've also got that focus, that tunnel vision. Yep, I'm ready for it, mate. I'm going to bring it on. It's going to be a big day down there. We're going to have some great darts matches. And I think it's all live, live and exclusive across the TalkSport platform it all is. day as well. Make sure you tune in into the YouTube channel because that will be hilarious from 1 o'clock and all the fallout on drive. Where Darren Bent will be there, and I've no doubt if he does get beat on Spencer Oliver, Spencer Oliver will also be there rubbing in that victory, no doubt about that. Uh, still to come. At around about half past eight this evening, so 40 minutes from now, we're going to be crossing over to Talk Sport, the main network for the WBO Cruiserweight Championship of the World between Chris Billum Smith and Matthias Masternak. Make sure you come and join us for that. Before it, Ben Whitaker will be in the ring showcasing his skills too. But right now, another Olympian, a woman that picked up that gold medal, and she's uh, making her sixth walk now to the professional uh, ring. It is the one and only Miss Lauren Price. Big aspirations in the welterweight division for next year, challenging for world title honours. Hopefully this will hold her in good stead. Calling you through, Lauren Price versus Sylvia Botto. It is Spencer Oliver, but first, John Rowling. Thank you, Adam. Two fighters meet centre ring. Lauren Price, 29-year-old Welsh Olympic gold medalist in her sixth professional outing lives in Istreg Zmenach in the Rimney Valley in Wales against Sylvia Bortot, 38-year-old from Italy. She's in her 16th fight here. She's won 11 and had three defeats, one draw. Lost on points, you might remember, in Manchester in September against the talented American Michaela Mayer, who's going to be fighting for the IBF World Welterweight title in January against Natasha Jonas. But Price, so well organized, very good all-round sports woman. She gave up football in 2014, but by then she played for Cardiff City and for Wales. She gave it up to concentrate on boxing, and what a decision that has been, because she really is an outstanding fighter. 29 years old now, watched at ringside by her partner, Karis Artingstall, who's also undefeated as a professional. And Lauren Price, Southpaw, has started nice and confidently here. Yeah, so, bo boxing well here. Lauren Price on that outside, out that Southpaw stance, as you said, John, and slipped into a rhythm already, starting to find the range with that jab. And Borto, she has that experience, she's been around a long time, former European champion, as you rightly said, Fox, Michaela Mayer, pushed Michaela Mayer to points, but this is a good, confident start here from Prices. She's above us, stands centre of the ring, spearing out that jab. Eight two-minute rounds, this is. The fight's made at welterweight, and Price 
having the better of the opening three min of the opening two minutes. Flat-footed, walks towards the Italian, tries to throw a right hand, misses, but then lands with a left hook and a right hook, and then a solid straight left hand as well. Good picking of punches by Price. Good accuracy as we move into the final ten seconds of the opener, and Price. Well, Barthard is trying to rally, trying to mount attacks of her own, but all the work of substance has come from the Welsh woman. Good first round. Yep, good solid start there from Lauren Price. Got off with a jab very well. Just moving around the brim of the ring. Sylvia Borto stalking forward, but couldn't really cope with the speed of foot, speed of hand of Lauren Price. Dominant first round there. Borto, you know, she's got that experience. She knows her way around the ring. I've seen her in the ring on a number of occasions. She's teamed up. And guess what? She's going to have to be tonight because Lauren Price looks on point there in that first round. Price, powerfully built, stands about five foot five and a half, sitting patiently on her stool, getting words of advice. And they'll be fairly confident and pleased with what's been produced in the opening two minutes in that corner, in that Price seconds. corner because she, from the word go, looked as though she was very much on the money, Second kept her shape well, and, and boxed two. really neatly now as the second round begins. Yep, here we go. Lauren Price taking centre of the ring straight away again, out of that southpaw stance, stance flicks out the jab straight away, getting into that rhythm. These two-minute rounds, John, the pace tends to be a little bit higher as well. Well, Bartow hasn't really settled into anything too much so far. Heavily tattooed the Italian across her, her back and her right arm. And now here comes Price powering forward, lands a couple of headshots, right hand and left hand. Tries to throw a right hand through the middle and then gets with him with a left to the body. Got a good balance. It's so, so economical with her movement, Lauren Price. Doesn't lose, doesn't waste a great deal. Yeah, real solid look about Lauren Price, like you say, foot. Work is very good. She knows she's controlling the distance. Shot selection's great. Just whipped in a right hook under the elbows there of Borto as well. But yeah, she's got everything. There's a real solid look about Price. And obviously boxing now down at a lower weight, you'd expect the power to be a little bit more there as well. She won the Olympic gold medal at middleweight. Now boxing down at welterweight. Actually the first women bo woman boxer to win a British title as well. And she's getting the better of this second round as well to add to the first. And the Italian being forced just to cover up as she comes in, gloves held high, tries to throw a left hand, right hand. Price easily evades, good footwork. Now up onto her toes, circling in a clockwise direction. Throws a left hand, taken on the gloves by Botta. And then Price backpedals and picks out one, two accurate shots to the head. Good work from the from the uh, Welsh favourite here and she's getting on top again in the closing stages of this second round. We're hearing from Gareth A. Davis in a moment who's got the old ro roving microphone out there at ringside somewhere. He'll shock and surprise us no doubt with who he's got alongside him. A moment or two ago it was Harry Redknapp. Who are you talking to now Gareth? Uh, he's not as good looking as Harry Red. No he is. It's Callum Sim Simpson. He's wearing a kind of chenille pink top tonight, looking fly. Can I say that? 13 and 09 knockout. So, trying to be like you, mate. Almost look as fly as you. Not quite, though. You've got your pure Barnsley on tonight. Now, listen, tell me, you're graduating in 2024, aren't you? It's title fight time, isn't it? Yeah, this is 2024 strap season. You know, I think I'm, uh, I'm out of the end of fame, hopefully defending my WWE title. Then after that, I want the winner of Cullen Shelley, you know, for the British and Commonwealth. And then you know, I'm going to speak to Box, so I want to try and get three defences in uh, next year. And I want to win it outright next year, then move up European level, and then yeah, just keep, keep, on, keep, on, keep on doing that. Is it Jack Cullen you want to win that? Because I know you've been after him, or is it just the belt? I, I think Jack Cullen will be a bigger fight for me. I think he's got more experience. It'll be harder to fight for me, and it's a fight that I want. Lovely. Great to see you as always, man. And you're growing all the time. Yeah, thank you. Top man. Thank you very much, Gareth. Action underway once again in this welterweight contest. Lauren Price of Wales, the Olympic gold medalist against Silvia Bartot of Salgareda in Italy.
and I've got Lauren Price a couple of rounds ahead already and really she's the one with the moves with the superior footwork superior judge of distance and greater accuracy yep she slipped into the rhythm John you're right in that what you say there I've got her a couple of rounds up as well Borto just can't deal with the speed of hand and speed of foot of Price at the moment her boxing IQ just seems to be up there as I say that she drives the left hand straight through the middle that drives Borto's head back forces the Italian back and then moves back to take centre ring. No punches being landed at the moment. The Italian misses with an attempted left hook and then left hand right, right hand left hand from Price fighting out of the south four stamps, remember? And she's not really had to take anything of note as yet. All the scoring shots have come really from Price. Not a great deal from the Italian. That's 50 seconds now of this third round of an eight rounder and Bartok wants to hold on and drag Price down. The referee has a word with her and says you're not allowed to do that. That's outside the letter of the law and the action underway again. Yet yeah, Borto just trying to use her experience a bit, trying to break the rhythm there of Lauren Price, who's boxing beautifully at the moment behind that southpaw stance, and now starting to sit down on her shots, drive that left hand through, just slam one into the ribs there of Borto. Yeah, that was a good body shot that she landed. Tries to throw a straight left now, taken on the gloves by Borto. Borto, and then a body shot from Price. Last few seconds of this round, and the pattern has really been pretty much the same as the first two. She's dominated it, and the power shots have been from her. Body shots have been telling, and that's giving her a clear advantage. Yep, you're right, John. I think you know the pattern's been the same from that opening belt. Another dominant round there from Lauren Price, completely controlling the space, moving around the perimeter of the ring, working everything behind the jab. Started sitting down on her left crosses as well, slammed a couple of good body shots in there, left through the middle as well. Another clear dominant round there from Lauren Price. There's still a solid look about Sylvia Beauforto. You know, she's taking the shots really well, and she shows why she's campaigned at this level for so long. You are probably well aware that you're listening to Boxing from Bournemouth on TalkSport 2, but remember to switch over to TalkSport, the main channel, at half past eight, when we're going to be bringing you Ben Whitaker in action in the light heavyweight division. And our top of the bill fight, round about nine o'clock, which is Chris Dylan Smith against Matthias Masternak. Smith, Dylan Smith defending his WBO World Cruiserweight title. We move now into the fourth round of this eight rounder. And really, you wonder if Porto has got anything in her armory which is going to be able to get Price out of a rhythm because Price has boxed to a, a style and a pattern which we're used to if you've watched her in previous fights or heard us talking about her you know that she's very compact very accurate difficult to tag out of that southpaw stance and a very complete fighter there she goes again in and out little combination scoring shots and Barto able to do nothing about it yeah you, you hit now on the head there John the Barto is a girl that is stalking forward but her limitations are letting her down here because Lauren Price moving around and just growing in confidence good head movement there again from Price dominating behind that jab driving the left hands through like she did there and she's slowly chipping away and Borto you know stalking forward showing showing that she's tough but very limited in there at the moment as Price slams another one to him she's not a huge one punch knockout artist Lauren Price she relies on an accumulation of punches very very difficult to tag down from that southpaw stance good defense and then she lands accurate shots particularly left hook like that one which goes into the body and then another left hook right hook from Price both scoring punches nothing of note coming back from Barto and Price pushes the Italian back and she's starting to look a little bit jaded now, Barto, in this fourth round. The fight nearing its halfway stage, and Price absolutely in control. Let's use this as a comparison. Michaela Meyer, former Euro, um, unified super featherweight champion, Fox Borto last time out. And I've got to tell you, I think Lauren Price is doing a better job than Michaela Meyer done. So, you know, take that, take it as you will. Another dominant round there from Lauren Price. Pretty much the same as the first three. Into the corner now. This is with Lauren Price. Be confident you can push each other a little bit. Or underneath or close now, okay, when you're inside, all right? 
just moving a little bit too much away, just a couple of movements and then you're ready again to box. What you don't want to do is just back off too much all the time, all right? Because she'll start coming forward then to give her a bit of a momentum, all right? Yeah. Once you're boxing and, and, and you make a miss and you, and, and you get to the side, you've got your body shot or you've got your hook on, all right? You don't need to look for it when you're starting out, okay? Right. One, two, jab, jab, move, make a miss, count out, get to the right. Bit more speed now, okay? She's standing in front of you a little bit now. You can double up with your one, two, one, two, one, two. Ease back, what back hand up. Sound advice is wanting her now to pick it up. Lauren Price had a little bit more speed maybe to her work because she, on our card, and I think on pretty much anybody's card, she's clearly taken the first four rounds. It's her fight to lose, and now she can go through the gears maybe a little bit in the remaining minutes of this fight. Yep, just got to keep her focus here. Lauren Price, do what she's doing. Keep chipping away. You know, we know Sylvia Porto is tough. You know, we've seen that. In the past, when she's boxed, she comes forward very stubborn in what she does. But the beautiful boxing skills here from Lauren Price dominating this contest as we go into the second half. The left hook has been the real points scoring punch that she's produced in this fight, as ever. She really does produce very, very fluid movement after that southpaw stance and so often finishes her attacks and her combinations with a left hook to the body. Barto trying to walk her down, trying to get her onto the ropes, which she's not throwing any punches as she does so. Not able to get Price out of this rhythm. Price waiting for Barto to come and then throws a little flurry of punches. Barto holds on and the referee has to split them. But again, the advantage in that exchange, the only scoring punches came from Price. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Bartos the one that's stalking forward, but there's no sense of urgency about what she's doing. She's not letting her hands go. It's like she's happy just to survive in there. Like she wants to hear the final bell, get you know, lose on points or something like that, because she's not really showing any ambition apart from walking forward and soaking up a lot of shots. And again, dominant round here from Lauren Price. Last 25 seconds of the fifth round, Lauren Price has had things absolutely all her own way. She's, she has done in all her paid outings so far as a professional. Five wins out of five and well on her way to picking up win next number six. And you wonder when you look at her, who is out there who's really going to be able to live with her and who's going to be able to provide some sort of big test for her. That's another round for Lauren Price. It's five out of five. Gareth is still somewhere with his microphone. What do you make of it, Gareth? Well, I'm in a very cushioned seat right now. I'm in the VVIP seats. Just three or four seats down from Lauren's partner, Karis Artinstall, who we know is a beast in there when she gets in there. She's absolutely focused on her partner. I'm a little bit disappointed. If I can say this, shout me down. Lauren is so dominant in this fight. She's a brilliant fighting artist her movements fantastic look at the power in her legs I'd like to see her sustain more of those combinations she's throwing through the rounds and get her opponent out of there frankly what it's you, such a dominant performance what do you reckon to that Spencer well suggesting listen, maybe that she's operating in the comfort zone yeah, yeah well listen no what Laura Price will recognize is the four toe is tough she's stubborn she's a former European champion she's campaigned at that level Lauren will only sit on her when she feels the timing's right you know that you get a sense of that when you're moving around you're chipping away like Lauren's chipping away and you can feel it you can feel your opponent slowly breaking down, slowly losing strength, slowly losing the will, really. You can, you can feel like you're stealing their soul a little bit. And we, she's not seeing that here because Porto is walking forward still very confidently. So Lauren doing the right thing and not taking that chance. I'm struggling to, to remember an attack or even worthwhile punches from Porto at any stage of this fight. And the fighter from the valleys of South Wales, Lauren Price, here in this sixth round of eight, eight two-minute rounds at welterweight, absolutely in control. Lands another hook to the body. Porto made to miss with an attempted straight right, and Price ties her up, holds on, and the referee has to split them. Yep, Price doing pretty much as she's done in those first five rounds, moving around, working everything behind the jab, little combinations together. Not really taking any chances, not willing to roll the dice just yet. Good one, two again there from Price. But she just seems comfortable to get the victory here, as opposed to 
like Gareth said, taking that gamble, sitting there, rolling the dice and trying to get her opponent out of there. So it looks as way the way this is going right now, six of eight and Lauren Price in control but not taking any chances. Well, there is an argument, isn't there? Why take chances? She's so far in control. Two more solid body shots. You heard thud home from Lauren Price, a right hand and a left hand and she's absolutely dominating this fight. Porto game keeps coming forward, but as she does so again and again, she's met by quality punches from Price. Two taken on the gloves there from Porto, and another one, but then a solid right hook to the body, and another one from Price, a left hook interspersed those two, and she finishes on top with a right to the head. Good work there from Lauren Price, and she's just about there. Yep, but then we saw exactly what we saw there with Lauren Price the last 10, 15 seconds. She decided to sit there, she decided to sit in the pocket and try and see if she could take Porto down a little bit, but recognise she's still very strong. You enjoying this, Adam? Uh, yeah, to an extent. Everything you say, boys, is absolutely spot on. She's in cruise control, she's an elite amateur, isn't she? At the end of the day, she's got that Olympic gold medal for a reason. I agree, though, with what Gareth was saying, because at the end of the day, this is the entertainment business. And we're going to see very shortly a young man that kind of gets that it's the entertainment business in Ben Whitaker. He's also well-schooled in the amateur game, coming out of the Olympics, and he's taken to the professional game knowing full well that, OK, it's, yes, what you do inside the ring, but it's also what how you make the fans feel. You've got to go through the gears. If she's got big aspirations of becoming a world champion next year and getting a big fight, she's got to capture the imagination of the likes of the Natasha Jonasons. And right now, this is cruising to a point, wide points this is your victory. And moving confidently towards this as we move now into the seventh of the eight rounds. And all six so far have clearly gone to Lauren Price. Borto on the front foot, trying to bob and weave her way in. Price sees her coming, lands a left hand, taken on the gloves by the Italian, and Price giving ground, waiting for Borto to come, waiting for her to commit herself, throws a little flurry of punches, but nothing lands. Left hook to the body did so, and the referee has to split the two of them, has a word with the Italian for holding on. Yep, you can understand the cat man's frustrations there, because, like he says, Lauren Price totally in control, so, entertainment, they sit on it a little bit, because... Borto, to be fair, she's stalking forward, but she doesn't look to have anything in the locker to bother Lauren Price. So, Lauren maybe should start sitting there, last couple of rounds, you know, trying to impress, trying to capture the imagination of the viewing public. Well, I suppose she's impressing insofar as she's producing a shutout performance. Borto coming forward again, a couple of times by headshots as she does so, and then a good left hand into the body and the right hand, all scoring punches for Lauren Price. Referee has to call break again as we come towards the final 30 seconds of this seventh round. We'll go into the Price corner at the end of this round, assuming it goes to that point, and hear what sort of advice she's getting, whether or not she's going to be told to get out there and really produce a grandstand finish, and let's see a little bit of action. And she's powering on the punches a little bit more in the closing stages of this seventh round. But I've said it before and say it again, the pattern remains the same. The South for Lauren Price, just with the boxing advantage, and she's She's seemingly being put under pressure by Borto, but Borto not really landing anything. And that's another round for Lauren Price. Predictable. That's the way it is. Price is winning very handily. We listen now into the Price corner. Right, yeah. When she sits inside, that little left up will put right up as well if she sits in front of you. You know once you've done your box, you make a miss. Or that body shot on that hand. Yeah. Yeah. Boxing nice, let's have a really good round of boxing this round, edging round to your right. When you box her and you make a miss, then counter. Fair. But don't then lean in underneath yeah. and go to the side, okay? Fair. Come on, last round. Nice and calm, nice and relaxed. Hands up nice and nice. You'll come and have a go. Just box her, move your feet, keep her on the end of your reach. You got it? Yep. Relax, good. Professional, calm, sweet, sweet deep before and after, smart, smart. Don't rush, don't have your hands down, okay? Well, there you are, keep it professional, keep it calm, keep on doing what you're doing and just continue to chip away and produce those body shots which have reaped such dividends so far and continue winning it and winning it your way, stay calm. Yep, I suppose what Rob McCracken was saying there in a nutshell was, you know, safety first, 
don't take any chances, move around, and, you know, take this round like you've taken the first seven. But the argument is, and what Adam Catchall was even saying there was, the argument is, is it enough? You know, we want this entertainment. You know, this is all about making a stamp in the professional ranks. And you need to see a little bit more. I think that Lauren now could roll the dice a little bit. I think that she could take that gamble and try and put her opponent on the back foot. She's got the physicalities to do that. She's got the strength, the southpaw style. Porto seems to be quite limited in her movements when she comes forward in straight lines. So let's see something a little bit different here from Lauren Price. That's the only thing that's missing from this performance. You want to see a sustained spell of attacking from the Welsh boxer who gets told off for using her shoulder as she got in close. Then she does land a couple of body shots. No great power in them, but good accuracy, both scoring shots. And again, there's an untidy sort of clinch, and the referee has to split them as Bartow's head goes underneath the left arm of Price into the final 45 seconds with right hand from Price. Bartow takes it easily and then covers up with a high-held guard. She's not had Price in any sort of difficulty at any stage in this fight, though. And I suppose that the Price camp will say, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. It's boxing in its purest form, hit and don't be hit, and that's what she's doing. Absolutely. Listen, this is for the boxing purists. You know, you'd appreciate the technical ability of Lauren Price, you know, the punch selection, you know, that she's doing, working the head and the body so well, controlling the space, the movement from left to right is good. But yes, she, as I say that, she steps it up, slams the left uppercut in, comes over with a right hook as well. Little bit of a grandstand finish there. Dominant performance from Lauren Price. Won every round on my scorecard. And listen, she looked so much better in those last few seconds, though, when she let those punches go, Spenny. Yeah, and I the, agree, the crowd reacted to it, and she was able to do it pretty much when she wanted in those fi that final 20 seconds. And it does beg the question, you know, from a promoter's point of view, from a selling point of view, why not just go for it a little bit sooner? Yeah, totally agree with everything you've just said there. I will echo that, echo that as well. You know, I know that Laura Price has got that boxing ability. I know that she's tough. And, you know, this is the entertainment business. And I would like to see her sitting there and maybe pushing her opponent back a little bit more than she did tonight. But, look, credit where credit's due. She dominated every round there against a former European champion, you know, former girl that's operating at top level and she's done a good job dominant performance right we're going to get the score pretty quickly here and i think it's going to be surely confirmed eight rounds out of eight 80 to 72 big mo has the piece of paper in his hand i say big mo because he stands about six foot seven he really is a big lad in his very smart green Ladies suit and, and here he is after eight full rounds we go to referee lee every for the official decision he sees the contest 80 to 72, declaring your winner and still undefeated, Lauren Price! No surprises there on the Juchi scorecard, Lauren Price getting the job done once again. Uh, throughout the course of that, of course, we were going back and forth and having a little bit of a comment on the performance of Lauren Price. And she's punch perfect, she's far too good for Bartow, as uh, I think we will all conclude on that. I just have a, a fear that Lauren Price is one of the, what you would class as stellar female fighters that Boxer have and Sky Sports have along the lines of uh, the Caroline Dubois of this world and I know that Caroline's in attendance this evening. When I, when I think of both of those girls, especially Caroline recently, she's un starting to understand the entertainment factor of the sport. Yes, she cruises certain fights, but then at a point in the fight, she'll put her foot down and she'll go for the finish. And even if it doesn't come, you can absolutely see the change of the gear going through the fight of which then gets the, fa the fans on the edge of the seat and they go oh I'm into this I haven't got that yet with Lauren and this is, listen I don't want to be that hater or anything like that I understand how good this girl is she's going to the very top and she will be a world champion there's no doubt in my mind about that I'm just talking from an entertainment point of view if you're a fan buying a ticket are you rushing to buy a ticket to watch Lauren Price fight at the moment that's I, the big question I get it I get exactly what you're saying totally understand exactly what you're saying you watch Caroline Dubois, you know who's come through. She lost in the quarterfinals, actually, very narrowly in the Olympics. But you look at her and there's something about her. There's some excitement factor. You know, she goes forward. You know, she 
you know, that she lets the shots go, she sits in the pocket. I get what you're saying about Lauren, great boxer, excellent boxing IQ, yeah. but it is for the purest. You really have to, you know, be a casual fan that wants to see a little bit of a fight, wants to see a little bit of entertainment. Yeah. Maybe not enough. You know, I think that's maybe what she needs to work on. Because it's there, she's got it in the locker, but she just needs to do that. I think that that was a little bit too safety first for me tonight. And I totally understand what you're saying there. You know, she was in the fight where the other girl was never in it. Yeah. Never looked like being in it. And you just felt that the pattern needed to change. And the only one that could change that was Lauren Price. And she didn't. The, the reason maybe why I'm being a little harsh on her is because Martin had already been in with Michaela Meyer as John brought up in, in commentary and we'd seen Michaela Meyer go the distance with Martin. So we had a benchmark. We know that Meyer's going to be challenging Natasha Jonas and we're all excited about that fight, of course, on January the 20th of next year. I just thought Lauren had an opportunity tonight. Go make a statement, get on that microphone right now and get lippy Lauren. and say, listen, I know what's coming up in January. I've got my eye on those girls. Let them th duke it out and then I'll have a piece of that pie. You know, I just... I'm not there yet with her, like I am with other fighters. I, I, I'm there with you as well. I, I, I totally, totally get that. You know, she is an elite fighter. She will go on and win a world title, but we want a little bit of entertainment with that as well. Power got to start showing. Where were the uppercuts? I was screaming uppercuts from the VIP seats. Karis was looking at me in a strange way. Look, she's a brilliant boxer. Fantastic. She's so powerfully strong. There she where are the uppercuts? <laughs> Car Car <laughs> He's getting abuse now. Oh, Carry on. No, 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 no. Carry on. I just, I just think she looks, she looks so strong. I just want to see a bit more power from her. Why are you whispering? Why are you whispering? Are you, are you afraid that Carrie's giving you a rise? I don't want to upset Carrie. <laughs> Listen, to, to be fair, to be fair, you wouldn't want to upset Carrie, would you? Absolutely and she, not. she is in hearing distance. So, yeah, be quiet there, Mr. Davis. I just think next year at some point she's going to get the opportunity. Maybe, maybe listen, maybe as I'm analysing this now, her style is absolutely going to work against someone who is trying to come to beat her, so trying to come and win. Natasha Jonas, for example, is going to try and come and win against the uh, a Laura Price, which then will br give more gaps for her brilliant technique. Two southpaws, eh? Yeah, absolutely great fight. Listen, Natasha Jonas has got to get through uh, Michaela Maya, no doubt. Uh, at, uh, on January 20th at the start of next year, which will be an absolute cracking fight. Lauren Price, uh, we all conclude he's going all the way. Fingers crossed we get to see some of those exciting fights next year. Uh, now then, we are switching channels, ladies and gentlemen. So those that have been with us on TalkSport 2 for the uh, majority of the evening so far, we are flipping over to the main channel. That's right, we're going to TalkSport uh, for the core main event, which involves Ben Whitaker, and then that main event, the world title fight in the Cruiserweight division between Chris Billumsmith and Matthias Masternight. We will remain on the YouTube boxing channel, so therefore you can see Gareth A. Davis in all his splendor. Make sure you stick with us. We'll be back in a minute on TalkSport.
you, mate. It's all right, mate. Just trying to hunt down Kano. Need that Sully pick, don't I? You know it. We need that top boy collab. Am I on a, a, a dry? Uh, we've got world title action on a Sunday night. It's all live on TalkSport. We'll be there at the end. TalkSport will be the last one. How long have I got, man? Thank you. Is there anything better in boxing than fighting in a world title fight? in your hometown. Chris Billam smith put Bournemouth on the map earlier this year as he defeated Lawrence Acoli at the Vitality Stadium. Tonight, in his first title defence, he's straight back in at the deep end and he'll need every decibel of that home support against Matthias Masternak. We've got world title action on a Sunday night and it's live on TalkSport. Welcome to the International Centre in Bournemouth for World Title Action on a Sunday evening live on Talk Sport. I'm Adam Catterall, pleasure to be in your company uh, and welcome listeners over from Talk Sport 2 where we've been for the majority of the evening watching Fran Hennessy, Lee Cutler and Lauren Price already getting valuable victories on their resume. In a moment or two, the core main event, Ben Whitaker will be taking on Stephen Leonetti. And then it's all about the world title in the cruiserweight division. The WBO champion Chris Billum Smith will be defending against Matthias Masternak. Alongside me for this big night of title action, Gareth A. Davies. And the decibel levels are going up just a touch here on the south coast. Well, look, Billum Smith won the world title here in May on a balmy night in an ugly fight against Lawrence Coley. Matthias Masternak is a genuine contender at world level. This is the chance for Billum Smith in front of his home crowd to put himself in the shop window and be talked to about alongside the likes of Jai Opataya, who most people think is the number one in the division. Isaac Chamberlain's here, just walked in front of me. Richard Riakpour's here working for Sky tonight. Um, Chef Clark, who was in the studio with us last night, is here as well. It's a who's who right now of 200 pound fighters. Billum Smith is a very tenacious guy. He's got the crowd on his side. It's an amazing atmosphere tonight, but he's just got to get the job done in a very, very tricky fight. Absolutely. Uh, as well as consuming this on TalkSport and across the network, you can watch us on the TalkSport Boxing YouTube channel. That's right. Yes, we are not just in your ears. You can see the visuals as well, if you wish. And Gareth A. Davis in all his splendor. The hair has been beautifully quaffed tonight and you can watch it on the bo uh, on the talk sport boxing youtube channel get yourself stuck in the comment section is open as well of where you can contribute to the show uh, so coming up a little bit later on the wbo cruiserweight championship of the world chris Billum smith and matthias masternak it's a proper fight it's a real fight and we're looking forward uh, to bringing you that uh, around about nine o'clock is when they'll be making the ring walk for it right now though a ballerina is just at uh, the top of the ring walk as they are going to be welcoming in a uh, former Olympian and a person making their way in their professional ranks, the one and only Ben Whitaker. And Ben Whitaker, Gareth, 
absolutely is taking to the professional game like a duck to water. We're getting the rendition of Swan Lake here right now. We are a ballerina in a balaclava. Listen, in Bournemouth Bay, how about that? Beautiful, balletic, that's what we want from Ben Whitaker tonight. He's chasing the other light heavyweights in the world. He won a silver medal. He likes a bit of piano music. He likes to showboat. I've given him a hard time in post-fight interviews, but he is so talented. But he's up against a guy who wants to take that away from him tonight. Can't wait. He gets the entertainment business. We've been speaking about being the entertainer. These elite amateurs, when they cross over Spencer Oliver, they've got to make that transition in a way which catches the imagination of the fan base. He's got an opportunity tonight. Football's been and done throughout the course of the day. The majority of the audience now are tuned into boxing on a Sunday evening. It's a rarity. Normally, everybody's, you know, kicking back and watching Harvey and all that. Now, there's a bit of sports action on a Sunday night, live on TalkSport. Go and catch the imagination of the fans. Absolutely. Listen, it will pull in a big audience game. Being on a Sunday night, Ben Whitaker now has just made his entrance. He's just come out in the road there, standing with his back to the crowd. This kid... Is entertainment that's the world we live in right now it's not just about how good you are in a boxing ring it's the entertainment factor as well and he's got something special about him Ben Whitaker he's an extreme talent but there's something about him as well very infectious very contagious everything about him is a very likable young man he's cocky he's brash Shades of Nassim Hamid there as well. He's got that X-Factor, there's no doubt about that. He's had a frustrating year, Gareth, injuries and what have you. I'm expecting explosion tonight. I'm yeah. expecting him to really finish the year off in style. Yeah, and it's a very unusual arena. Back up against the stage. A big, long stand of fans. He milked it on the way in tonight. I think he's a guy, the harder the opposition is, the better he will become. You can't showboat like that if you don't have those skills behind it. And I don't think we've seen him yet against a level of opponent that's going to get the greatest out of him. No, absolutely not. You know, we, no, we, we, he, he's got to move up loads of levels before you see the best of Ben Whitaker. You know, we need to see him in those fights where he's got to bite down a little bit. He has to think a little bit. Right now, you know, he's cruising through these opponents because that's the level that he's Ladies at. And he's and elite. This is your chief support bout of the evening. Eight three-minute rounds. In the light heavyweight division, promoted by Ben Shalom and Boxer, and brought to you live on Sky Sports and NBC's Peacock TV. Our referee in charge when the bell rings, Reese Carter. Let's meet the fighters. First, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing the black trunks with white trim. He stands six feet, three inches tall. He weighed in at 12 stone, eight pounds. He holds a professional record of 11 victories versus two defeats and one draw with three of those wins coming by way of knockout and he fights out of milan lombardia italy introducing steven leonetti opponent fighting out of the red corner wearing the white black and red trunks he stands six feet three inches tall he weighed in at 12 stone six pounds he comes to us with a perfect undefeated record of four wins no losses with three of those wins coming by way of knockout and he fights out of Darleston, West Midlands, England. Introducing the Olympic silver medalist and one of the fastest rising stars in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the surgeon, Ben Tell you what, Gareth, some reception for Ben Whitaker. This is not his hometown, but the fans have come out to see him. All Listen, right, he's Marmite, this guy. You love him or you hate him, but he will grow, gathering more and more and more fans. He loves these occasions. He does love these occasions. He's got an opportunity in the co main event here. The main event still to come this evening the WBO Cruiserweight Championship of the World on the line. Chris Billum Smith defending for the first time 
against top content and a man that's been there and done it on the European scene, Matthias Masternak. Can he step up, the man from Poland, to become world champion this evening? We're going to be bringing you that very, very shortly here on TalkSport. Right now, though, it's Ben Whitaker's in the ring and calling you through it. Spencer Oliver and John Rowling. Eight three-minute rounds, light heavyweights. Ben Whitaker, clearly the taller man, stands around six foot three. The Albanian now based in Milan. Stavan Leonetti Deje lost in February to the Latvian Ralph Vilkan. He's had two wins since then, both on points, but he's not really anything of a puncher. Ben Whitaker here in his fifth fight, so fleet footed, good mobility, and he fights out of an orthodox stance, so he can switch it. Last fight, he beat Gordon Jordan Grants with a third round knockout and beat Vladimir Veliski with an eighth round TKO back in July. He was a silver, as you've heard, in the 2020 Olympics and puts together a nice combination right hand and the left hand. Yep, yeah, already slipped into a rhythm here. Ben Whitaker, a little bit of showboating, showboating going on as well, finding the target already. And Deje, I've got to say, he's going to have a hard night tonight. I would think that is very likely. He's up on his toes trying to be mobile, Deje, but Ben Whitaker just walking flat-footed after him, reaching out with that long left hand. Can't find the target with it, then just fainting to throw blows. And then a left hand does come in from Deje. But nothing really of note thrown in. Oh, hello. And he pulled Deje off his feet. Deje sunk to the canvas. And when he was down there, Whitaker threw a punch. And the referee, well, he gets away with it. I can think of a few referees that have taken a very dim view of that. Yet yeah, a little bit cheeky there from Ben Whitaker, who again is showboating, slips around, turns around. The referee could actually pull him up for that as well. Deje, he's not getting tucked into it all. Gets caught with a big left hook. He's been in the corner. Big good. right hand now. Really good right hand from Whitaker again. Does a little jig of celebration as much as to say, everybody see that? That was the right hand. That's what I can do. Now lands a left hand and Deje grins at him as much as to say, well, you might hurt some people with that, but you haven't hurt me. And then Whitaker lands another right hand. Deje, fleet footed trying to provide a mobile target, but the only worthwhile punches right now appear to be coming from Whitaker. Yeah, real solid look about Whitaker as he stands in the centre of the ring, just trying to create those opening, flicks out the jab, lands that shot well. There's a dangerous, solid look about Whitaker here. Last few seconds of this opening round, Deje lands with a jab of his own. Whitaker hasn't dominated this first round quite maybe as much as he would have wished but he's I think done enough to have taken it a couple of jabs from Whitaker scoring punches as we move into the final 10 seconds and Whitaker like a limbo dancer getting away from a pressure situation and uh, Deje sees the funny side of it smiles at Whitaker as he goes back to his corner but Whitaker for me doing enough to take that out Yep, sorry, Whitaker won that opener, definitely there was um, a lot of clowning around from Ben Whitaker, but, you know, oozing confidence in there, landing some good, solid shots, Deje, you know, struggled in there, and there was an air of frustration about Deje there towards the end of the round as well, it's going to be a tough, tough night for him, Ben Whitaker showing what an extreme talent he is now expect Whitaker now to start sitting down on some shots here starting to put the shots together you know he's done the showboating he's clowned around a little bit he's landed a couple of good solid dangerous shots but expect him to pick it up here in this second round well he's getting some words of advice from Sugar Hill Stewart his trainer probably saying something precisely along those lines you're listening to Fight Night Live on Talk Sport in partnership with William Hill get epic value all season with William Hill and remember 18 plus be gambleaware.org for the necessary advice into the second round of eight Whitaker for me taking that opening round are we going to see a few more fireworks now as we move into the second no real meaningful punches thrown as yet Whitaker flat-footed stalking Deje, who well, he claims to be six foot three, but he doesn't look as tall as Whitaker to me. 
No, Whitaker stands around six foot one. He is tall, he's rangy, four light heavyweight. He, he throws some good shots as well, Whitaker. But let's see if he's going to turn the screw a little bit here, stop clowning around as much as he has been, and start putting those shots together. Faints to throw a left hand, puts a left hand into the body of Deje, and then leans back and catch, tries to catch Deje with a left hook as he comes in. A couple of jabs, doubles up on that one, Whitaker. Deje not really having the technical ability to put anything on Whitaker at the moment. Fighting switch momentarily out of the sound four. Now goes back to Orthodox, pushes Whitaker with a jab in his face, and the referee has to split. A bit of a bit of a non-event right now. Aiming to throw a right hand short of the target, Whitaker. Yeah, Whitaker, very slippery, very elusive. Just spins his opponent there as well. Referee just starting to get have a tough job here. He needs to get a grip of this, the referee, because Whitaker using every opportunity to do a bit of showboating and show a few of his near the borderline tricks. Deje throws a left jab, short of the target. Whitaker tries to throw a left jab of his own, but then gets his forearm into the face of Deje. Referee has to split them, and Whitaker gets away without being ticked off for that one. Minute to go in this second round. Yeah, Whitaker's still stalking forward, looking for that shot. He's looking for that show real knockout. That's probably where he's going wrong here. I just want to see him relax, start putting those shots together, you know. He's looking for the big shot, the spectacular finish. And when you look, it doesn't come. Whitaker tries to drive the right hand to the body. Deje turns him out of the corner. All a little bit scrappy in there at the moment. And the referee has to split them once more. How many times have I said that already in this fight? And Deje holds on, clamps Whitaker close to him, and the referee shouts break once more. We're going to go into the corner at the end of this round, and here, what advice Sugar, Sugar Hill Stewart is going to be giving to Ben Whitaker, who falls short with a left hand and a right hand, trying to produce a, a chopping right hand with power. Couldn't find the target, and Deje backpedaling caught on the arm by a left hook paints to throw a right hand thinks better of it and a very cool well, and now the two of them go forehead to forehead at the end of the round and that frankly is just stupid and we don't need to see it let's go into the corner don't shoot out here shoot it right up in there what is that crease yeah remember the old guys and stuff and just push it right up through the middle just, just poke it up in there Boxing good. One other shot. Yep, doing good. Just keep working that jab. This like that round you had a little bit uh, out here. Make sure you keep that shoulder up there. Another shot. Keep that pressure on now, Benjamin. She hates the pressure. I'm only gonna tell you one more thing. You wanna control him, control him with your right foot. Because he's going that way, you want that right get your footwork right and saying closing instructions there what did you make of that little exchange at the end of the round when they went absolute, absolutely head to head literally yeah Ben Whitaker's got to be careful to be honest because there is a lot of showboating he spins his opponents down round and I think there was a little bit of frustration from Deje there and Ben Whitaker met him head on and they both nearly headbutted each other so he's got to be careful here he can't afford to get into that silly sort of stuff he can pick up cuts lose points from doing stuff like that so just needs to tone it down a little bit Deje lands a straight right hand getting out of the southpaw stance now and tidy clinch and Whitaker not finding it particularly easy to find his shots almost got in with a chopping right hand there but Deje saw it coming now he does land solid right hand tried to really wind up on a follow-up but went through thin air and Deje giving ground comes off the ropes and lands a solid looking straight left hand but Whitaker for the first time there really starting to find big headshots and here he goes again yeah Whitaker trying to sit down on his shots now loading up that right hand and for the first time in the contest through a four punch combination that's what he needs to do now Whitaker we get the single shots let's put the punches together punches in bunches let's see if he can do it in the second half of this third round 
gave him the first round, gave him the second as well, yeah. And uh, he's, he's winning it, but not spectacularly. But here in the third round, he has at last found some power shots. Deje pushed back by the referee. A little bit of blood coming from his mouth now, Deje. I think that's a testimony to those right hands that Ben Whitaker has been able to land. Deje, oh, and there's now quite a lot of blood on the face of Deje. And he goes down. Body shot and a chopping right, and he's gone down, and he's getting the count, and it goes to eight, and he nods to the referee and says, I'm OK to go on, but a minute to go, and it's a long minute. Yeah, he certainly is, John. I tell you, there's a problem with Deje's mouth here. The mouth's open, it's bleeding heavily. This could even be a broken jaw. He was complaining to the referee. Whitaker said that he's clowning around, showboating in there, looking outside of the crowd. Trying to do it, frustration from Deje. But Ben Whitaker well, needs to you, get on with the job. And you hear what the, what the crowd make of it. There are a few of them cheering, but there are also a few jeers and boos. And the referee is speaking to him now and saying, cut it out. And you hear exactly what this Bournemouth crowd makes of it. They don't mind seeing somebody showing extreme talent, but they don't like somebody who is contemptuously trying to take the meat. Yeah, that's exactly it, and the crowd didn't like that at all. Whitaker just needs to get on with a job here. He's got his opponent in a lot of trouble. There is a problem with that draw, I'm sure, and he just feel that Ben now just turns the screw, sits down on the shots, combinations together, like that one-two. He just landed there. He could get this job done. Bravely, Deje trying to come back in the last few seconds of the round. We're going to hear from uh, Adam and Gareth at the end of this one, see how they make it. And it's all Whitaker, but he had a pretty stern telling off there from the ref. There's no need to embarrass your opponent in the way that he's attempting to embarrass his opponent. This is boxing at the end of the day, and it's all built upon respect. He's a very talented lad, he's Ben Whitaker. And it's obvious that he's levels above the opponent that's in front of him right now. He's got his opponent hurt. Go through the gears and give us something to crow about. The crowd have shown what they feel about the way that he's just acted there. I don't think I need to say any more. This next round is a big round for him. Don't mess about. Get out there. Go and do what you're supposed to do. Take it seriously for three minutes and you'll get this guy stopped. Yeah, he's very unique, isn't he? They say you can't play boxing. And he's kind of playing boxing in there. I know his hands are high, and he, his guard is there when he's in close. No problem with that. But but no, there's no problem. But it's him taking him out of his opponent the way he's doing it. There does seem to be a lack of respect. But this guy can't wait to see him in with Dan Aziz and, and with Joshua Watsi and Anthony Yard in. He can't seven, do that eight, with them boys. He can't do this see. with them boys. I, that's what's fascinating. Sorry, John. Where you go now into the fourth round. Don't apologise. I enjoy hearing you, Gareth. As I'm sure all the listeners do, you're listening to Fight Night Live, Fight Night Live on Talk Sport, and this is our support billing, main support, Ben Whitaker, the undefeated Olympic silver medalist up against Stephen Leonetti Deje, Albanian, now fighting out of Milan. And our main event coming up after that is Chris Billum Smith against Matthias Mastanak. The WBO cruiserweight crown, and that follows. Uppercut from Whitaker just grazed the chin of Deje, and signs that Whitaker is trying to plant his feet and dodge. Tremendous right hand, Deje down, and he ain't going to get up. This is all over. The referee's ended it. He's taking the gun shield out. It was a peach of a right hand from Whitaker. Absolutely brilliant punch. Deje out from the moment it landed. And that is what he can do. You don't have to be contemptuous. You don't have to take the mick. Just find the punches and let them do the talking. John, that's exactly what he needed to do. Stop clowning around. Get on with a job. You know, he got Stern telling off in that third round. We saw the damage that he'd done. He had his opponent, Deje, down in the third. And he had to pick, build on that. And that's exactly what he'd done. he come forward. There was a menacing look about his work at the beginning of that round. He let the right hand go. The left hook landing flush. Deje went down. Was never going to beat the count. The referee doing a good job there, stopping it straight away. And as Deje, I say that, Deje now up on his stall, just getting the medical attention that is needed. But what a finish from Ben Whitaker. Well, you, you can't really play, praise that punch highly enough. It was timed to perfection. Straight right hand, absolutely detonated onto the 
chin of Deje straight into his face, stopped him in, in his tracks. Down he went, counted out. He was out before he hit the canvas, really, and the referee had no doubt about it. It had to finish right there, right then. And for Ben Whitaker, a fourth stoppage victory, five wins in all now. And I have huge admiration for the talent of this lad when he actually gets on with it and fights as he did do there in that fourth round. He is so impressive. He certainly is. You know, he just underlined exactly what it was. You hear the crowd here. If you can hear the crowd cheering and clapping, applauding, that's to Deje. He's got up off his stall. He's well. He's just saluted the crowd as well. Ben Whittaker takes him to the centre of the ring. The crowd love that. He's asking the crowd to give him an applause, and that's what he should do as well. Great stuff there, but I agree with you, John, and what you were saying there. You know, when he gets down to it and does what he does, he showed the extreme talent, the levels that he's at. You know, you're talking about a division that's stacked with talent right now in this country. We've got Anthony Yard, you know, we've got Dan Aziz, we've got Joshua Boatsy, but this kid in the next 24 months could be hot on their heels. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see the time scale, just how long it takes him to get there. The crowd, by the way, are seeing replays of that huge shot which put his man away. Great right hand, really was an absolute pearler. But he's against a guy here who is frankly not even at European level or possibly not even at top domestic level. No. The questions are still to be asked. And of course, one of the biggest questions, as Mike Tyson always said, everybody has a plan until they get smacked in the face. Well, listen, you know, we will find that out with Ben Whittaker because at this sort of level, this sort of standard, you know, he's not going to get tested. You know, we know that. We know how good he is. Olympic silver medalist losing to a great Cuban in the final. You know, look, he's been a little bit injury prone, not been as active as he would like to have been this year. But let me tell you, that was a sensational foot of finish bring on 2024 because i'm looking forward gentlemen. to this kid's development referee reese carter calls a stop to this contest at 54 seconds of round number four declaring your winner by knockout and still undefeated the surgeon ben Whitaker. so there you have it the minute he stopped messing about he delivered an unbelievable viral moment. Knockout in the fourth round for Ben Whitaker. A frustrating year, full of injuries for him. But he's back with a bang and finishes 2023 in style. Roll on 2024. Uh, still to come is our main event. We see Chris Billum Smith defend his WBO Cruiserweight Championship against Matthias Masternak. Let's get the latest odds in order with William Hill. Joining us now to give us the latest starts is William Hills, Lee Phelps. Lee, what have you got for us, mate? Top stuff, Lee. Thank you very much. That was a look ahead to the latest odds in partnership with William Hill. Top prize guaranteed this weekend, comparison with selected competitors and excludes enhanced prices. Further restrictions, terms and conditions apply. You've got to be over 18. Be gamblerword.org. We did a bit of work together in camp, maybe with rivals, but uh, we couldn't put that behind us. Uh, it was a great fight, and I hope you enjoyed it.
think people are starting to... Spence, hopefully we're going to uh, hear from Ben Whitaker very, very shortly. He's just addressing the crowd that is in the arena right now. Gareth A. Davis is just waiting for him, so we'll get that interview very, very shortly. What did you make of that performance? Because for, for nine minutes, it's an incredibly frustrating watch. We know how good he is, and then all of a sudden, when he the minute he takes it seriously, bang, he delivers. Listen, and, and that's exactly it, you know. It reminds me a lot of a young Nassim Hamed, where we saw that with Niz, Naz, where, you know, he was frustrating opponents when he won the European bantamweight title against Vincenzo Belcastro he was considered a great fighter you know Naz didn't show him the respect people didn't particularly like it a lot but that's what Nazim done and he went on and look what look what he sort of delivered at this level Ben Whittaker's going to do that he's a character he's showbiz Adam we were talking about it earlier in the show that is what this world is about right now you know that's what the next generation like they like that showbiz factor I mean the crowd didn't like a couple of things there that he done you know maybe the disrespect this is a gladiatorial sport you have to give that man some respect but at the same time you have to let him know I'm the man and that's exactly what he's done there and you're right in what you say when he stopped clowning around third round he had his opponent down not sure if he broke his jaw because it was a bad you know badly bleeding from his mouth yeah. fourth round he come out after having the telling off with the referee and he got on with a job he threw the right hand fell, fell a little bit short and then boom left hook lands flush and it was all over world class power what a great you know what a, like I, I said the light heavyweight division in Britain right now is brilliant this kid will be hot on their heels in the next sort of 12 to 24 months he is a supreme talent, and it will be the knockout that goes viral. There's no doubt about that. The ring walk, I've no doubt, will get some pop as well on social media. The things that he says works as well. He's got the whole package, but every now and again, he just slips into that mode sometimes when he's in the ring that rubs a couple of fans up the wrong way. Hopefully, as he steps up in class and takes on the likes of the Azizis and the Boatzis of this world, we are going to get to see what Ben Whitaker really is all about. Gareth A. Davis is with the surgeon right I'm now. I'm good, I'm good. We're live at On Talk okay. Sport, Ben. Uh, well done, another great performance, a great finish. They say you can't play boxing, but you've got this ability to play. Is it nervous energy? What is it? You know what it is? It's just styles. Um, you see many styles. My style, foot straight to the opponent. It might look like I'm messing around, but there's method to the madness. I'm bringing him in, I'm bringing him in. Because when we sparred, it's like a chess match. So I knew if I frustrate him, mess around, it would draw him in. And that's why I got the knockout. You are, you come in with the, the black swan in a balaclava. You love the showmanship. It is very important as part of one's standing, if you like. Yeah, 100%. We can all just walk to the ring and have a scrap. At the end of the day, these fans are coming out. So you want them to give something to remember. So hopefully I did that hopefully many more for 2024 you don't want to rush and you've wished everyone a merry christmas but i want to know about the happy new year yeah. because dan aziz joshua Boatzi, anthony yard callum smith i could go on yeah, there's go a load of those guys in the uk yeah. how long before you can take your unique style in with them truthfully sometime mid mid 2024 end of 2024 i want to get in the ring of two more times maybe just because you know i've had a bit of a stagnant career then as soon as i get back in the ring with some more of those performances trip my name in there because i'm young i'm fresh i'm fast and i pack a punch now as well you do pack a punch many congratulations great to see you and i'm not going to knock i'm not going to knock your showboating <laughs> tonight because when it you were talking, it, it, it works, it works. Great to see you. If I started hopping on one leg and got dropped, then we can start going crazy. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. And like I said, Merry Christmas and New Year is the surgeons. Great, thank you. Listen, he's a supreme talent. Ben Whitaker there doing the business. Once again, delivering a fourth round knockout uh, for these fans here in Bournemouth. Uh, time for a little bit of world title action. That's what we've got coming up for you. The WBO Cruiserweight Championship of the World is on the line. Chris Billum Smith defending for the first time against Matthias Masanak, and he's live on Talk Sport next.
We're in Bournemouth this evening at the International Centre for World Championship action on a Sunday evening. Can't beat it, can you? Chris Billum Smith with his first world title defence taking on Matthias Masternak. That's our next fight this evening on the Talk Sport Network. And it's not the biggest matchup of uh, the year or the week because the Orman himself, that's right, Spencer Oliver is going to be taking to the dartboard next Friday. We have an exciting event happening live on TalkSport in partnership with the TalkSport Football Trivia Board Game. Eight of TalkSport's finest take on to the hockey to battle it out to be crowned the inaugural TSD World Darts Champion. Hawksby and Jacobs from 1 o'clock is your destination for all the action uh, anchored by our very own Jim White. Then Adrian Durham and Darren Bent will be bringing you the fallout from four on drive. Don't just listen to the action on TalkSport. Watch it all unfold live in vision on TalkSport's YouTube channel. That's Friday from 1pm and Spencer Oliver will be taking on Darren Bent it's an absolute barnstormer that cannot be missed next Friday from 1 Gareth A. Davies right yeah. now is ringside with Ben Shalom I am Ben Ben Shalom is just asking me do I like Ben Whitaker? okay of course I like Ben Whitaker, but the thing about him is he kind of teases you then he dances and then you think he's going to go with AWOL and then he produces magic. He's a quite an interesting guy to promote. Oh, it's incredibly interesting. I mean, when you're around greatness, they can always be slightly crazy. And so you never know what he's going to do next. Look at any sport. It's the, it's the great ones and the crazy ones. He is crazy, but he's, he's, he's remarkably intelligent. He, he comes up with everything, visionary, everything. And uh, he's, a, he's a pleasure to promote, to be honest. He's always surprising them. Dan Aziz, Joshua Boatsy, when's he going to be in with them? He reckons by the end of 2024, early 2025. That is ambition. Listen, it was, it's been a frustrating year, Gareth, honestly. It's been hard. Like he, he debuted here 18 months ago, and there was so much momentum and so much noise around this future star. It's been difficult, but watching how hard he works behind the scenes, through an injury like he had was was incredible to see it fills me with confidence makes him even more hungry i can't wait for next year where he can be active and uh, and do everything that we believe he will well the reason you brought the fighting circus here is about to happen we're back in bournemouth the battle in the bay a very tough fight mateus masternak against chris billam smith tonight the hordes are here i understand he's gonna walk down that red carpet down the stairs and into the ring it's a really tough fight for him, and yet it's a great showcase for Chris tonight as well. Listen, I don't think it's a showcase. I think this is a really tough fight, and the closer it gets, the more people are coming up to me. Master that we've seen all week, so relaxed. He feels he's waited a long time for this opportunity. What a career he's had. He's waited 52 fights. 52 fights. He's got more knockouts than Chris Bill and Smith has, has fights. He's, he's had an incredible resume. He's lost twice to two very, very superb fighters in the prime of their careers, in Tony Pelley and Dorticus. And, uh, and this could be a tough night. I really, you know, this is going to be a very tough fight. But Chris Smith needs to prove his world level. He needs to show that Lawrence O'Coley and being what, who was widely considered the best cruiserweight in the world at the time, and it wasn't because of the stadium, wasn't because he knew him, wasn't because of Shane McGuigan's master plan. It's because Chris Miller Smith is a world class fighter, and that's what tonight's about. Well, enjoy it, Ben. We're enjoying it. It's great to be with you here. You've created a great fighting circus here tonight. We're a few seconds away from the ring walks. Back to the guys on the desk. Thank you, Ben Shalom. It's Thank you very much, Gareth. We're Ben Shalom there. It is refreshing to hear that because we said it right at the start of the show when we began the broadcast on Talk Sport 2. They could have done an easy knockover this evening. They could have done an easy come home. Right, he's this world champion. Here you go. Let's finish the year off with a nice little takeover and we'll move on into 2024 with something serious. But today's Masternak is a serious fight for a first title defence. This is proper. I love it. Respect where respect's due. And you've got to respect Chris Billum Smith. I spoke to him, you know, yesterday about that, you know, about the task ahead. Why Masternak, who's been around, seems like forever, 17 years as a pro, 53 fights in former European champion, hasn't been beaten since 2018, and that was against a good fighter in Dortkus. What I'm saying is, why take that when there's other options there? Chris's answer was plain and simple, because I want the tests. You know, I want to see where I'm at. I'm now champion. Let's see if I've elevated or raised my game. See if I've elevated to another level. We'll find that out tonight against Masternak. Potential banana skin with massive fights on the horizon. 
Richard Riakpour that's in the box, the stable. He's there or thereabouts. He's looking for the fight. He, you know, giving Chris Billum Smith that opportunity to, you know, right the wrongs. And, you know, there's other big fights out there as well. In the Cruiserweight division, Lawrence Acoli is waiting for that rematch. We've got Jai Opatia there as well, the IBF champion. Big, big fights out there for him. So he has to come through tonight. Atmosphere in here, by the way, is absolutely insane. Silly season, Christmas season, and they are going for it in here. It is. The decibel levels have just risen here at the International Centre in Bournemouth. And the who's who of the boxing world have taken those seats ringside. We've been speaking to plenty of them in the uh, cruiserweight and light heavyweight divisions. But also in attendance this evening, we've got pop stars, soap stars, actors galore. They're all here. Kano's in the house. Sully from Top Boy. Can't mean a little bit of that. Harry Redknapp's here. And the one and only Mr. Simon Jordan's here. So it must be a big night, Gareth A. Davis. Absolutely indeed. you know what this reminds me of? I just suddenly realised the Hulu Theatre in New York. It does have a little bit of a feel of that. It also feels a little bit like the event, the arena that you were in on Friday night, the three arena in Dublin for the BFL. There's something quite auditorium-esque about this. It's red seating. The fans are absolutely packed. They're all actually behind us right now, but you are right in what you're saying. It is very Hulu theatre that now turns into Madison Square Garden. When Michael Conlon made his debut at Madison Square Garden in the theatre, he walked down those steps like Conlon did with Conor McGregor, if yeah. you recall. And Conor McGregor stole all the headlines by, I don't know, going crazy at ringside with everyone. I don't know if he's got Conor McGregor with him tonight. And Shane McGuigan will be keeping him very calm indeed as Masternet, I'll let you take it away, starts his war. Well, we can see on our monitor, monitor now that the tough Polish fighter, 36 years of age, Matthias Masternak, is just leaving his dressing room and making his way to the top of the ring wall as Bon Jovi. The doors and tones of John Bon Jovi are ringing around the international centre. And get ready for this because the crowd are about to take it up a level. There you go. Hey, you can tell it's Christmas time, can't you? It's like being on the stag with Benidorm again. The hometown hero is back on the south coast and we're about to get it underway. Ladies and gentlemen, the your main event of the evening and Bournemouth we are sold out are you ready for a title fight this battle is scheduled for 12 three minute rounds and it is for the WBO cruiserweight championship of the world Introducing first, the challenger, please welcome, Mateus Masternak! Matthias Masternak for the 53rd time in his professional career. He's 36 years of age now with a record of 47 and 5. 31 of them coming by the way in a knockout. And this is the time for him to challenge for world honours. He's been on the European scene for such a long period of time. Multiple wins on that European scene. And the defeats that he's suffered in his career have been narrow points, decision, losses. Whether they come by a split or unanimous, only stop once on the during his professional tenure, and that was down to a cut that he suffered early doors in a fight against the Grons. This is a tough, rugged opponent, and for a first title defence, this is incredibly difficult tonight for Chris Phillips Smith. But that is the clock that this man is cut from. As on our monitor, the gentleman makes his way out of his dressing room and to the top of his ring wall. Interesting, Gareth, to see that there's a massive Polish contingent actually in the arena this evening that have made the trip to come and support their man. And his opponent fighting out of the red corner 
the champion from Morning, England, Chris Bill Chris Bill and Smith at the top of the ring wall, back to the audience, turns round to face this cauldron of fire. And the place has absolutely erupted. Earlier on this year at the Vitality Stadium, he achieved his dream of becoming the WBO Cruiserweight Champion when he defeated Lawrence Acoli. Right now, though, in his first title defence, he has the opportunity to rubber stamp his year as he marches his way towards his ring in the middle of the International Centre to take on the very tough Matthias Masternak. 33 years of age now, Chris Phillips Smith. 20th time that he's made the walk. 12 knockouts through his 18 victories. Only that one loss to Richard Reactmore. Tonight is an opportunity for him to rubber stamp himself as the top contender to the number one spot in the cruiserweight division, Gary. Listen, we've got to remember how many great cruiserweights we've had in the country. Philip Smith, Lawrence Ciccoli, David Hay, Enzo Macronelli. Our man on Sky tonight, Johnny Nelson. Carl Thompson was a great cruiserweight, number one. Of, we, we, it's a division rich with British fighters. And the guy he's facing tonight, Mateus Mastanac, Remember, Tony Bellew beat David Hayes, and this guy went 12 rounds in a close fight with Tony Bellew. Uniel Dortikos comes to mind as well. He's knocked him. What Billum Smith must do tonight, and he's got a great guy in his corner in Shane McGuigan. Barry McGuigan sitting right in front of us here, ringside, is B commanding early. He's a strong, powerful guy, Billum Smith, and he needs to be dominant early, in my view. This crowd, the decibel levels are going up, and he might need them tonight because this is as tough as it gets in the cruiserweight division. Big Mo is ready. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin this world championship main event to perform both the national anthem of Poland and God Save the King, please welcome Emily Haig.
gentlemen, this is your main event of the evening. 12 three-minute rounds for the WBO Cruiserweight Championship of the World. Promoted by Ben Shalom and Boxer and brought to you by our headline partner, Bet365, and our official partners, Everlast, Wow Hydrate, Integritas Property Group, and Who Dares Gyms. Our supervisor in charge, John Handler. Our area representative, Barry Freeman. Our timekeeper, Mark Shannon. And our judge at ringside, Steve Gray, Jago Schwalenda, and Patrick Morley. And our referee in charge when the bell rings, John Latham. So, Bournemouth, I need you all to get up out of your seats. Raise your drinks high and get wild. Let's meet the fighters. First, the challenger fighting out of the blue corner. Wearing the camouflage trunks with black and green trim. He stands six feet, one inch tall. He went in at 14 stone, two pounds. He holds a professional record of 47 wins versus five losses with 31 wins coming my way of knockout. And he fights out of Volkswagen, Poland. Introducing the former WBA Intercontinental, the former IBO Intercontinental, the former WBC International, and the former European Cruiserweight Champion. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the master, Mateus Just stands centering the two of them, poor with jabs, and then Billum Smith doubles up with his own left hand lead, throws a right into the body of Masternak, who we know is granite chinned. He is very, very durable, Masternak, and he's got genuine power in both hands. Good job from, from Masternak. Second one taken on the gloves by Billum Smith, who walks forward trying to cut off the ring, trying to produce an option trying to produce an outlet for that right hand. They hold on, they clinch. Is the referee going to have to split them? He does. Yep, 
first minute gone of this first round. Chris Billum Smith trying to push forward, trying to stamp his authority on this contest early, and that's what's needed here. You can't allow Masternak to get into any sort of rhythm because he's rough, he's tough. Stylistically, this one should be fireworks. According to Shane McGuigan, the coach, she said this is going to be attritional. He said both these fighters take too many punches at times and it could be that sort of a fight it could turn out to be an absolute war a couple of hooks to the body from Masternak but then back comes Billum Smith landed a decent right hand over the top and neither one nor the other at the moment is showing to be physically dominant good work from Masternak lands a left hook into the body forward comes Billum Smith throws a jab feints to throw another one got through the second one didn't now he does double up with that left hand lead jabbing well moving well and performing with confidence in this opening round lovely jab again both of them landing shots to the to the head spearing their way through with straight left hand leads yeah good solid look about Chris Billum Smith here working well behind that jab he's established that early right hand goes in as well Masternak doing a good job moving around the perimeter of the ring but there's a solid look here in this opening round from Chris Billum Smith what a good opening round it is both of them having their moments left hand lead from Masternak Billum Smith turns him around and commands centre ring then tries to go to work to the body Masternak holds on, clinches on and it's an untidy sort of maul and the referee's going to have to split them and does and we're into the last 15 seconds of this opening round Billum Smith working behind that jab again and brings in the right hand whips it over the top and then Masternak clings on pulls him close and that has been the way it's been for a significant part but that's a good opening round for Billum Smith and I think he did enough behind that good left jab to take the first three minutes. Yeah, John, I'm with you. I think he established the jab early. He was pushing forward, but he was educated pressure. And that's what he had to do against Matthias Masternak, who's very tough, rough, and he'll try and make it crude if he has to. But Bill Smith stamped his authority on that one. Good opening round, if he pleased. He's got that out of the way. But I think what we've seen there, John, what we've seen there is that this is going to be a tough, gruelling contest. We've predicted that all week. Stylistically, we always said it was a tough one against Masternak, who actually is a voluntary defence. But we always said this was going to be tough. And I think we've just witnessed that in that first round. This could be a long night. I think that's almost certain. You're listening to Fight Night Live on Talk Sports in partnership with William Hill. Get epic value all season with William Hill. World Cruiserweight title fight. Chris Billum Smith against Matthias Masternak. Bournemouth against Ivan Isker in Poland. He lives in Wroclaw now, Masternak. And there's a lot of Poles here cheering him on. He's waited a long time for a world title opportunity. Is Billum Smith going to be able to deny him? We move into the second round. First round, we both gave to Billum Smith, who tries to bring a right hand over the top, scores with that, and then clubs Masternak with a right into the ribcage. Good solid punch. And now they lean on and clinch again. And the referee's going to have to split them. And John Latham, dwarfed by these two big men, steps in and says, move on and get on with it. And now it's Masternak who fights back as Bill and Smith tries to pour on the pressure. The crowd are with them with every blow here. I hope this atmosphere is coming across because it is stunning. Yeah, pressure here from Chris Billum Smith, but Masternak not intimidated. He's coming back with his own shots as well. Billum Smith gets tied up. Masternak getting rough on the inside, lands a left hook. Did the elbow go in as well? This is going to be tough. It's crawling. Good right hand there from Masternak, and Billum Smith comes back. Yeah, he took it well, Billum Smith. He has tested though. It was a solid right hand right into the side of the head of Chris Billum Smith from Masternak. And they're just signs of four. Oh, great shot from Masternak. Billum Smith takes it again. Overhand, right hand. And now back comes Billum Smith trying to match fire with fire. That might have been the biggest punch of the fight to this point. And it came from Masternak. Yeah, another good solid shot there from Masternak. This is already getting tough 
in there, both guys, there's no feeling out process here, Chris Millen Smith lying on the ropes, Masternak trying to push forward, 1-2 goes in from Masternak, and Smith here he comes again, well. here comes Masternak, looking for him, he's caught him with another big right hand, and the Polish contingents are going crazy in here, they think their man is in with a real chance, and you better believe it, because Matthias Masternak most definitely does, and he's landed a couple of absolute peaches, right hands in this second round and he's shown just how dangerous he is yeah brilliant shots going in from Masternak another right hand goes in as well there and Billum Smith just looking a little bit bemused in there this is a good round here from the challenger Masternak Masternak into the last 30 seconds of the second round Billum Smith right to the body Masternak though has that right hand cocked he's looking for it he's looking for the big right hand again is he going to be able to find it looks for it Willem Smith goes underneath and is able to slip inside and the referee has to split them. Last 10 seconds, really dramatic round and we're going to be going into the Willem Smith corner where Shane McGuigan will give his reaction to this big round that for Masternak. Really good for the Polish challenger. Shane McGuigan now is in there with Chris Willem Smith. All right. He's got to put the emphasis on the jab. The emphasis is on the jab and throw a right hand to his chest and to his body. Stop trying to go over the shoulder. All right? Relax. Relax. Stay switched on. You see these shots coming from a mile off. They're just forcing it. Force it intelligent. Move your head and double up the jab. Once you double up the jab, you're only going to have to throw a right hand. And he's going to keep trying to punch you off him all the time. Move your head. Slot. Move your head. Slot. Let him punch himself out, all right? And you do it with a head movement and then you just jab, jab, jab and you start picking, picking the rounds up on the jab. Save your right hand. Yeah, that's exactly what he needs to do here. Chris Phillips 50, he needs to establish that jab. He needs to relax and get into the fight because that was a big round for Masternak. And if Willem Smith is tense and wanting to really turn on a superb performance for his fans, he needs to forget about all that and just concentrate on the game plan. Masternak starts well again, through a left into the body. Willem Smith, with that reach advantage, trying to double up on the jab, but he looks a, a little bit stiff in there. Masternak senses it and tries to whip a right hand over the top and another one. Willem Smith leaning on, clubs him with a left to the body. Referee looking to see whether he needs to split them, and he does. Yep, half a minute into this third round, and it's already getting rough. Big jab there from Masternak, unorthodox sort of style, driving the shots through the middle. Willem Smith needs to move the head off the line. He's getting punished here with the jabs and those right crosses. And Masternak looking good at the moment, Willem Smith has to have some moments of success another good jab from Masternak rock back Willem Smith's head but Willem Smith on the front foot trying to pile on the pressure Masternak takes it though Willem Smith misses with a right uppercut Masternak over the top with a right hand right hook into the side of the head of Willem Smith then a jab from Masternak and another one better work from the pole aimed a big right hand but couldn't find the target this time yet halfway through the round here and Masternak is the one is having all the success. Billum Smith piling forward. Masternak, hands tight, covering up well. Billum Smith sitting in the pocket, getting caught far too much at the moment. Big round again here for Masternak. Terrific atmosphere and a fight which is intriguing here. Billum Smith, though, is not dominating as I'm sure he would have hoped. And I know before it started, Spanny was saying he needs to make a bad start, and he's not really done that. The better start to this fight has come from the challenger, Matthias Masternak, who's backpedalling now and beats Willem Smith to the punch with a left-hand lead. But now Willem Smith does get through with his own jab and a left hook to the body. And then he comes in close and takes another right hand from Masternak as his left glove dropped low. He has to be wary of that because that right hand side, the big right hand of Masternak, that really is the danger punch. They come now with 30 seconds to go in this third round. We've got his equal level on our card before this, but has Masternak done enough to win this? Quite probably. Oh, big shot from Masternak. One, two, three headshots. And Willem Smith comes bravely back and lands a big right hand of his own.
Mustinak being forced to cover up, but that was a really powerful and accurate attack from Mustinak. More right hands from Mustinak, and Dylan Smith looks a little bit nonplussed by it all. Good shot again, this time a jab though from Dylan Smith, but it's been a big last minute for Mustinak. Might have taken the round. Here's Adam with. Phenomenal action, phenomenal action through that third round. I'm just getting a little bit concerned with Chris Billen Smith. When he's throwing his jab out, he's bringing it too low, he's not coming straight to his chin, and Mastanak's been able to counter over the top with that right hand, and he's catching him clean. Yes, Chris definitely tagged him in that round, but that's a Mastanak bound for me. I thought he was better all around for, the, for about two minutes and 50 of that. He needs to get on that jab, does Chris Billen Smith, otherwise it's going to slip away from him. What we're seeing from Mastanak, he might not have fought world titles, but he's fought a world level and we're seeing his experience in these early rounds he's fainting better he's taking a lot of bill and smith punches on the gloves but i must say towards the end of that round when bill and smith was hurt he really responded i do worry for him a little bit because he can be a plodder with his feet and it worries me let me tell you it's good to watch though isn't it it absolutely <laughs> is and if chris bill and smith doesn't change things around here he could get himself knocked out. Here we go into the fourth round, and he had some really anxious moments in the last minute of the third when his head was being rocked around by the attacks of Matthias Masternak. And Masternak is ahead at this stage in the fight. We're in the fourth round. Masternak aims the right hand. Dylan Smith ties him up, holds on. And Masternak has a real purposeful look about him. Dylan Smith, gloves higher now. He'll surely have been told he's got to keep that left hand lead up because he's been punished again and again and again. And, again. and Masternak now pushes Dylan Smith back onto the ropes. And for the first time, you get the sense that Masternak physically looks the stronger and the fresher. Yeah. Dylan Smith plods forward and walks straight into another clinch and another right hand. Yep, he's a tired look around Chris Billum Smith. He seems to be firing on all cylinders at the moment, where Masternak seems to be going through the gears. Like I say, Billum Smith trying to force this, pushing forward, misses wildly with a right hand. Masternak comes back with shots of his own. Yeah, you just feel that it's going Masternak's way at the moment. Masternak, 36 years old, with more miles on the clock. Is he going to be able to maintain this furious pace? Good right hand this time from Dylan Smith. Masternak takes it well, clinches, holds on, but the scoring punch in that exchange, the authority came from Dylan Smith with a really good right hand. Referee John Latham has to step between them and push them back. Masternak faints to throw a right hand, now he does. Dylan Smith saw it coming though, rode it to an extent and then takes another one. He's got to keep those gloves up high because he's a fairly static target. Yeah, Masternak growing in confidence here. There's a spring in his step. He's up on his toes, landing good shots. Billum Smith trying to come back, trying to find something from somewhere. But there's a solid look around Masternak in there, in this fourth round. Well, when you think the bookies had Chris Billum Smith, a red-hot favourite, you kind of look at this fight so far and think, what were they looking at? There's blood now around the face of Chris Billum Smith coming from his mouth, I think. And Masternak, unmarked, walking his man down, looking for another big right hand, and finds it again. And Billum Smith wants to hold on with 30 seconds to go. Really good shot again from Masternak, who is right in control up there. Yeah, Billum Smith's just taking a deep goal from there. Just spits on the floor. He's trying to find something from somewhere. Masternak, big right hand. Take. This is bad moment for Chris Billum Smith here. His mouth is hanging open. Masternak right in his face. The referee splits them. Oh, he looked for one huge right hand there, the Polish challenger. And you sense that he thinks that he can finish that. And that for Billum Smith, that round could not end too soon. And he falls onto his stool very, very heavily. Yeah, there was a slow laboured look as he walked back to his corner there. Chris Billum Smith, he was looking sorry for himself, spitting on the floor. I'm not sure how much fight he's got left in him right now, Chris Billum Smith. There's a there's a look of confidence over in the opposite corner. Masternak is oozing confidence. Let's go to the corner. Let's go to the corner and hear money. More jab. Double jab. Right hand. Double jab. Right hand. Left hook. Okay. Head movement. Sink in with your feet. Okay. You can't keep your side.
Matthias Mastinak has got Pietro Milchewski in his corner as his coach. What a good fighter he was. James De Gale knows all about him. Went the distance with him some 12 years ago, and it was a good fight. Here comes Mastinak, but back comes Bill and Smith with a right uppercut. Mastinak was looking for that huge right hand, which I'm sure he believes is the punch which he's going to win this fight by knockout. That's the fight, that's the punch that's going to do it. Yep, sense of urgency around Chris Billum Smith's work here in this fifth round. He's pushing forward, he's trying to change the play here from Masternak, but Masternak seems to have the perfect game plan. Moving around, landing jabs, good right hands for the middle as well. Masternak has to keep his work rate up though, because Chris Billum Smith is one phenomenally well conditioned athlete. Right hand from Masternak, thuds into the rib cage of Billum Smith, and he pushes Billum Smith back onto the corner post on the far side of the ring. Centre ring they are again now, left jab from Billum Smith and Masternak now holds on, just perhaps taking a little bit of a breather because it really has been fought at a frenetic pace this one. Two of them are really going to have to dig deep. Whoever's going to win this one is going to know that he's produced the performance of his life. The head of Masternak going in. Billum Smith looks to the referee. The referee says, get on with it. He's OK. Yeah, Master, uh, Billum Smith looking reddened down the left side of his face. Masternak goes with a big right hand. Gumshill comes out. Billum Smith trying to push forward. This is turning into a grueling contest here. Into the second half of this fifth round, and Masternak is the man in control. And Billum Smith, flat-footed, mouth hanging open. Looks as though he's starting to really feel the pace of this fight and the huge right hands that he's held. This is where he's going to have to dig deep. This is where he's going to have to find himself the resolve of the champion. Right hand from Masternak, and again the heads clash inside, and the referee has to split them. But the best punch again in that exchange came from Masternak. Willem Smith on the front foot, caught as he comes in by two right hands from Masternak. Yeah, Masternak landing fast with the punches, combination goes in, the Polish contingent here, getting behind their man, they sense something here, they sense it up, an upset, Billum Smith is biting down on his gum shield here, he's really got to find something. 30 seconds to go in this fifth round, Billum Smith bravely on his front foot, trying to match fire with fire, but he walks into another good left hand lead, and the right front, and overhand right. Barry McGuigan, who's involved in the management, of course, of Willem Smith, is on his feet in front of us, trying to implore his man to let his punches go. There's reddening around the ribcage of Masternak. He's taken plenty as well, and there's an untidy maul in the last few seconds of the round. But it's a round which, for all the bravery of Willem Smith, may well again have gone to Masternak. Here's Adam McGowan. And that's where I'm at with it, John. You know, there is a lot of bravery, and he does have success in these rounds as Chris Miller Smith, but he gets greedy and leaves himself wide open and gets countered by Masternak. Masternak's taking these rounds. He's got to change this up in some way, shape, or form. Otherwise, he's going to be on the wrong end of yeah. a decision loss here. It's a frenetic, desperate attempt at times to get the fight back. And Masternak is, is sitting back in a certain way, playing possum sometimes he's answering so everything isn't it soaking it up and countering when chris does bait when he does change body shape and change level he's making master that miss but i did fear for him in that round and i fear for him in the next couple i'd like to see him sit back and jab for a minute or two yeah I'll just you, slow it down a little bit i'll tell you where chris billum smith is at right now he's trying to force it he's trying to change the pace and it's not working for him master that just seems to have the game plan right now. Willem Smith with a nick underneath the left eyebrow. Masternak will know that. That's a, a testimony to the accuracy of those right hands. And it's a, a smear of grease on the face of Chris Willem Smith now, who's going to have to fight as never before. This is so much tougher for him than that fight against Lawrence O'Coley was back in May when he won the title. Masternak is producing all the problems he needs. Billum Smith standing tall, spears Masternak with the left hand lead, keeping his gloves up high now, trying to get into a rhythm, trying to 
stop Masternak doing what he did then, which was throw two solid hooks to the body. Yeah, Bill and Pitch Smith stalking forward, but walks straight into a solid jab again. There's reddening around the face of Bill and Smith, the left cheek, the right cheek, both swelling up. This is becoming hard in here for Bill and Smith. He's biting down on his gum shield right now. It's a fight which I always suspected was going to turn into some sort of a, a ring war. And for Chris Billam Smith, he's very much in the trenches already. And is he going to be able to find the strategy and the sheer will, the sheer resolve to pull himself back here? Left jab from Masnak, scoring punch, then the right over the top. Billam Smith trying to keep his gloves up, beaten to the punch again as Masnak scores with another jab. Billam Smith waiting for his moment, but he's got to let the punches go. Now he does throw the left jab, gets through the lead. But Masternak keeps a tight guard, left into the body from Billam Smith. That's better, and he needs more of that. Yep, he certainly does. He needs to roll the dice a little bit here. Billam Smith, he just feel that he's falling behind. There's a confident look around Masternak. He's up on his toes. He's flicking out the jab. Big left hook goes in there. Billam Smith looking slightly unsteady. Not going his way right now. Masternak also mark, starting to mark up. He's got a bruise under the right eye. And now Billam Smith comes in behind that left lead again and scores. And another one. That's better from Billam Smith. And he's having more success in this round. And the Bournemouth crowd are trying to lift him. They're trying to inspire him. It's been a great weekend for Bournemouth football. They want it to be a great weekend for Bournemouth boxing as well. Solid right hand from Billam Smith. And Masternak in close. Pulls his man on. And there's a clinch in there. And John Latham yet again has to split them. Yep, this and it was always going to be rough, tough and gruelling stylistically. Both these guys, that's what they're about. Double jab lands. Right hand goes in as well from Masternak. Billam Smith steps back, takes a goal for Bear, then goes back at it again. This is getting tough here. And Billam Smith is having his moments in the last few seconds of the round. Lands a chopping right hand and another jab. And the spring starting to go out of Masternak, but he lands a solid right hand of his own. And another. Oh, what a round. What a round. And people around here are standing up, applauding and cheering. And I tell you what... There was a, there's a seasoned security guy here who's working this fight and he's been working it for years and he blew his cheeks out, Spaddy, as much as to say, wow. Listen, that was tough. Chris Bill Smith landed a brilliant right hand. Masternak, for the first time in the contest, he was hurt. He went back, he regrouped, he come back. He landed a good right hand of his own. This all happened in the last 30 seconds of the round. What an atmosphere here. What a contest we've got. Masternak, Billam Smith, putting it all on the line. Billum Who's going to win? I'm not sure right Billum now. Smith came on well in the closing seconds, in the closing oh, minutes. Did he do enough to win the round, though? I don't know. Maybe he did, maybe not. Sergeant's out. Round seven. And at the halfway stage, however you score that, he's a long way in front, Masternak, surely. And Billum Smith who is athletic, fit, he's going to have to really dig deep in the second half of this fight and to claw it back. You're listening to our main event on Talk Sport this evening, the WBO World Cruiserweight title, Chris Billam Smith against Matthias Masternak, and Billam Smith again now is on the front foot, and I just get a sense that maybe Masternak, some of the spring from earlier on, is just starting to go out of, out of his work, and that Billam Smith is beginning to claw his way back into this fight. Yeah, both guys are about to dig deep here. Billam Smith has looked sorry for himself. There was a time there where I thought he was thinking about coming out of the contest. There seems to be a newfound energy about him, but Masternak lands a big one, two left hook. Billam Smith again looks hurt. This is tough, really tough, just as you thought Billam Smith may be pulling it back, John. Tough, but he took it, and now Billam Smith wants to return with power of his own. Oh, it takes another good right hand from Masternak. What a chin Billam Smith has shown that he's got. He's taken some absolutely flush right hands from Masternak. He's taken them, he's taken them well, and he's on the front foot looking for Masternak again. Lands with a jab, and another one, and another. Misses with a right hand over the top. It's all Billam Smith in that exchange. Pushes Masternak back. Halfway stage of the seventh round. 
and the Bournemouth favourite, the champion, remember, is doing well here. And there's a cut to the left eye now of Matthias Masternak. Yet yeah, heads go in there and Shane McGuigan, the trainer of Chris Billum Smith, is slamming the canvas. He's urging his man on. He's calling him on, telling him to move his head. There's some real tension in here right now. Where's this going to go? Both guys trying to take control of this contest and no one really got a foothold on it. And Masternak is starting to really get busted up though. Facially, that left eye doesn't look good. They're going to have to work on that one between rounds and try and staunch the flow of blood and do something about the bruising as well. There have been clashes of heads, there have been punches, but Phil and Smith may be having his best round here for some time in the seventh. Good work from Masternak, left hand, right hand, but now forward comes Dylan Smith again, makes Masternak miss with an overhand right, and then works away to the body, brings his shots up to the head, left hand and a right hand, we've got both scoring punches, and I tell you what, Barry McGuigan in front of us, he's almost living every punch, and Shane McGuigan in the corner as well. Shane McGuigan shadow boxing, literally in the corner, good left hook to the body from Dylan Smith, 10 seconds black and goes. Masternak now, looking busted up, split down the middle of his head as well. This is getting tough right now. What a great round that was for Chris Phillip Smith. And you talk about fighting with the resolve and the belief of the champion. He most definitely did that then. That was a stunning effort from Phillip Smith. Well down at the halfway stage. Round seven, we're into the second half of the fight, and maybe, maybe Chris Willem Smith has just had his most important round. I completely agree. This is going to come down to how badly you want it, it seems. Both of these guys in tip top condition, they're both having success. It was all Masternak between two and four, five, and six, maybe for me. That round seven there, he just seemed to have turned the tide a touch, and as the boys were saying in commentary, Gareth. Masternak is slowing, he's got to keep the foot down now as Chris Phillips Smith in order to get the job done down the back end. In a weird way, it's not a difficult fight to read. The last two rounds of Phillips Smith for me, he's a point behind now after seven for me, but it's a fantastic fight. But he's got the engine and the will to impose his skills on Masternak, who is still sitting down. Very, very slow to get up off his stool. I got oh, the pulled him out! I got it pulled him out! Philip Smith's won it! Masternak, for whatever reason, either he's quit or there's a problem we don't know about, but he's been pulled out. And Chris Philip Smith, after that tremendous round, the seventh, when he was on top and he changed the whole dynamic of the fight, there are celebrations in there now. He leapt onto the ropes, he holds his chain. Shane McGregor, and what a turnaround that was, and I do believe that with that terrific effort in the seventh round, that he broke the heart of Matthias Masternak and took him out of it, and Masternak, having felt the will and the desire of the champion, just didn't want any more. John Rawling, I don't know where that come from, you know, you said that there was a slight turning in the tide, Chris Willem Smith had a good round there in the seventh, but he needed that good round. Masternak was having so much success, Willem Smith had to ask questions of himself, and he'd done that. We've seen it before, we saw it when he won the world title back in May at the Vitality Stadium against Lawrence and Coley. A similar sort of thing here to fight down on his goal field. One thing Chris Willem Smith does, he gives you entertainment. What a brave boy. He was well beaten in the first half of that fight. Gareth had it by round. We had it significantly wider. We had it by maybe four, maybe five points in Masternak's favour. But he still believed Willem Smith. And I'm hearing maybe that there's a rib injury to Masternak and those big punches that he found. It might be that there's a cracked, ring, cracked rib in there for Masternak. And Willem Smith, anyway, he took him out and finished it. And that is the end of the fight. And he holds his arms a lot. Listen to the reaction, he's still the champion. Well, he's a reaction there because he had to find something from somewhere. Round seven, I'm hearing a body shot, a cracked rib from Masternak. He couldn't continue. William Smith 
when he needed to turn a screw, when he needed to find something, he found it. That's what champions do. He set up an unbelievable 2024 now with so many other champions. Unifications, Jai off the tire, rematch with Richard Riakpour, Lawrence Akoli rematch. There's so much out there for him right now. But one thing I can guarantee is, boys, we are coming back to Bournemouth. Gareth, Gareth, what, what, what a tough, tough guy. Both of them, I thought both of them showed incredible toughness in there. I've got to be honest, this is the world title fight. You're not going to get another opportunity to rock and roll again from a Ma Matthias Masternak point of view. Ladies Listen, I'll come back to this in a minute. Let's get the official uh, word Referee from Referee John Latham calls a stop to this contest. Two seconds into the eighth round due to a corner retirement due to an injury. Declaring your winner. And still! Chris Billum Smith made Matthias Masternak pull out of the fight after the seventh round, and therefore he is still the WBO Cruiserweight Champion of the World. What I was going to say yeah. is this is a world title fight. No, but you're never going to get another opportunity to rock and roll like this again at 36 years of age. But you don't know the physical effect no, I don't. of that ribbon. No, I no, don't. No, no, I'm not. Don't mean you. He may not be able to breathe properly. There might be something very. This is a very tough guy. Remember, who took all his punches who's been in against other guys before, who's not been stopped in his career. It, so was, a, it, was, just a, a, it was just a very strange stoppage, Gareth, the way that he pulled out. Like, I agree he, with Adam in some respect. How long he, was that mouthpiece out for as well, by yeah, the way? Yeah, but, but it, it was literally in the seventh round the damage was done, and he didn't come out. Now, I've got to say, 36 years of age, your first world title, and possibly your last world title opportunity, even if you come out and took one jab and it went no, no but I think there'll it. be good reason for it because this is yeah, a goal from his records. That's what I'm saying. Let's it's give not him a quitter. It's not a quitter. Oh, it's not it's not a quitter. So therefore, you would have to, you'd have to conclude, given the fact that the guys have 53 professional bouts and he is as hard as they come, you would have to conclude that that is a very serious situation for him to pull himself out of a world title you know fight. What but, but, but what you've got to look at right now is Billum Smith is a man who was getting beaten up in there for four rounds in a row. Yep. That's a guy that don't, he's not the greatest skill boxer in the world. He's not got the greatest footwork. He's got a massive desire, set of stones, though. Huge stones, great heart, champion's heart. And he's set this place alight for us, for all of us, Ab again tonight. Absolutely. Here's one for you guys. Could it have been that Matthias Masternak blew a gasket trying to get Billum Smith out of there? Maybe. And got caught with a body shot and just never had anything left. Well, it's like what you've just said there, right? Gareth kind of nailed it. Between rounds two and rounds number six, that was Masternak's fight. He was having his way with Chris Billum Smith. But there's something inside Chris Billum Smith that said, not tonight, buddy. And he flicked it. Could it be a case of, yeah, all right, he might be injured, but more so, did he have his heart broken in there, Spence? Because he's thrown the kitchen sink at him. He's not gone anywhere. He's not dropped him. He's caught him clean. And then he's still coming forward and landing big heavy balls they, in that seventh round. You know what they call that? They call that sucking out someone's soul. And that's what I'm saying. That's what could have happened to Masnack there, where you go, Listen, I know that when you hit a brick wall in there, you've got nothing left. You've thrown everything and the kitchen sink, which Masternak did. You know, that's what he done. Let's remember, he's been a pro 17 years. Yeah. He's had 53 fights. He's 36 years of age. You know, that is you know, that is a difficult thing to do with box at that pace, at that level, and sustain that sort of energy. It may have been that he just blew a gasket and had no fight left in him. The fact is, the fact is this. Chris Billum Smith made Matthias Masternak pull out of the fight. He made him walk away from this contest. That's what happened this evening. This was a, on paper an incredibly tough test Very. for Chris Billum Smith. Every single one of us in the build-up to this was saying, for a first title defense, 
this is really the risky. Said it. Absolutely. <laughs> but we commend it. We commend it from yeah. the promoter. We commend it from Chris's That's point of view. This is what we want to see. We want to see our champions in proper fights. We want to see them taking on proper title defences. That was a proper title defence. And for large percentages of that fight, he was up against it and it was going the wrong way. He turned the tide tonight, did Chris Bill and Smith. He's come of age, and now he sets up a fantastic 2024. Absolutely. Listen, that's what champions do. They, you know, they turn the tide. They don't feel sorry for themselves. At the end of round four, he walked back to that corner with his head down, and I looked at him, and as an ex-fighter, I'm looking at him going, this kid ain't got a lot left. I don't think he's, he, he wants much more of this. But he found something from somewhere. They call that a champion's mindset. That's what Billum Smith does. He's an entertainer. He fights with his heart on his sleeve. And he had to do that tonight. He had to dig deep. And he done it. And he turned it around. Credit where credit's due. Adam, I thought his effort in that seventh round, Billum Smith, was spine tingling. In commentary, I'd said I thought that the spring had gone out of Masternak and he wasn't the fighter in the sixth round that he had been in the third or the fourth. And there were signs that he was tiring. Yeah. But for Bill and Smith to dig in and produce the, the round that he did in the seventh was absolutely colossal. And you talk about champions resolve. That was it in three minutes. Absolutely encapsulated. He was. And he, listen, we said at the start of this, he might need this crowd tonight. They were sensational for him. They found something in that fifth and sixth round in order to spur him on, of which inspired him to crack on in the seventh. And as John just said, produced a phenomenal, phenomenal three minutes. Listen, he done that in his self-same arena, the big arena, against Isaac Chamberlain. He had to ask himself questions, and he done that against Zhou in this same arena, where he won in a fifth-round KO. He still had to ask questions. He had to dig deep. We saw it against Lawrence Acoli. What I'm trying to say is, what I'm trying to set up is, do not take Chris Billum Smith out of Bournemouth because this crowd <laughs> plays a big part a man in that pulling wants to you come through. Back. Yeah, I know no, you want to come back, no, mate. No, but what I'm saying is when you get into a certain situation in a fight, and John, you start feeling a little bit sorry for yourself, the crowd, trust me on this one, guys, helps you massively. I was a home fighter, so I always had the crowd behind me, and trust me, on a couple of defences of my European title, the crowd helped me they massively. Needed it. Yeah, you yeah. Ne I needed it. I needed that when I felt sorry for myself. He's and a quietly spoken lad. Yes. He is a gentleman. He's not a braggart. But my goodness, how eloquent he is when he gets in that boxing ring. He's not a thing of beauty. He's not a fancy technician. But he has got heart and he's got bravery absolutely in spades. And, that, and it's going to take some fighter to beat him because he goes in there believing I am the champion and I'm not going to let this go. Well, one man that has managed to beat him is Richard Riakpour, and that was a, a tough contest. Is that what we want to see next, gentlemen? Richard Riakpour is in attendance this evening. You would think, given that they're both under the same umbrella, and that Chris Billersmith has a loss to him, he'll want to right that wrong. Absolutely. Listen, that's where Chris told me he wants to be. He told me that in the week. He said, look, I want Jai Opatire. I want the unifications. I want the big fights. If that means going over old ground with Richard Riakpour, so be it. I'll do it. Bring it on. That's sort of like his character, and that's what we see in the ring. He fires with his heart on his sleeve. He's an entertainer. What a fight that would be, actually. Richard Riakpour, who's highly ranked in the WBO, he's the mandatory contender, against Chris Billum Smith, a rematch from 2019, split decision loss by Chris Billum Smith. We go again. That's Let's a, do it. That's Let's a, do a, it. That's a Vitality Stadium fight. Midsummer, get the sunshine out there. Fill the place out. I want to be there. Ab absolutely. Do not forget your budgie smugglers, because <laughs> guess what? We're going in the sea, baby. Uh, listen, if you're just tuning in to TalkSport, yeah, it's Sunday night. It's not the Saturday night fight night that we normally do. Uh, we've come down to the south coast, to the, uh, the International Centre in Bournemouth, because Chris Billum Smith was defending his WBO Cruiserweight World Championship against Matthias Masternak. We've built it all week as an incredibly tough contest. Masternak been there, done it, and got the T-shirt on the European level. Tonight he had his opportunity at fighting for a world title in his 53rd fight. And for large spades of this fight, Matthias Masternak was in control. First round was the Billum Smith round. Two, three, four, five, and possibly six was all Masternak. Before the seventh, when Chris Billum Smith found something from somewhere and turned this fight on his head. Therefore, resulted in Matthias Masternak not coming out for the eighth round. We believe that he's got some sort of rib injury, obviously inflicted by Chris Billum-Smith, but he decided not to per continue with the fight. 
into the eighth round. A phenomenal performance. Nobody's ever done that to uh, Matthias Masternak. And that is a feather in the cap to rubber stamp a sensational 2023 for Chris Bill and Smith. Yeah, it really has been a fairy tale story for Chris Bill and Smith, who's done it the hard way, done it on the road. British, Commonwealth, European, captured the world, Vitality Stadium, in front of his home fans, against an old sparring partner, gym mate in Lawrence and Coley, as a big underdog. Comes in here, takes on Matthias Masternak. Tough fight. Many people considered 50 50. Johnny Nelson, Sky TV, said Masternak wins this fight. It's all wrong for him stylistically. Respect where respect's due, man. In the sixth round, they were right. Did you? Absolutely. But you know what? This kid's mindset is different. That's what champions are cut from. They're cut from that cloth. And Chris Bill Smith's got that. Never say never. That old mentality that Cole Brotch had. Jermaine Taylor, first offence over in America. In Jermaine's backyard. Going into the 12th round. He's down by five rounds. But he had that champion's mindset. Stuck on it and won the contest. Bill Smith's cut from that cloth, mate. Well, we saw that in spades tonight. And this crowd are going to keep coming out time after time again. If they keep putting this kid on in these arenas on the south coast, he's going to keep filling them out because that was a performance of, of attrition, of heart, of guts, and he ended up getting the glory and remains the WBO Cruiserweight World Champion. There's a lot of fights in this division to get us all excited. We've just been speaking about Richard React for there's big unifications in there as well with the likes of the Jai Opatayas of this world who is due to be fighting on December 23rd. I've no doubt Chris Bill and Smith will have one eye on that contest as Chris Bill and Smith does make his way out of the ring right now. I've no doubt that he's going to get mobbed at some point. But Gareth A. Davis is hopefully going to grab his attention and point him our way. And we've got him. Here we go. Here's Gareth with Chris Bill and Smith. Many, many congratulations. You are the body snatcher tonight. I am indeed. Shane saw it in the build-up, he said there's a lump on his left rib. Target that, and I didn't to begin with, I was looking too big. And, uh, yeah, I mean, at round seven, I really started finding myself, put my shots together better. Um, and then I was ready to build, I, I settled. At the end of the round, they were like, that's it. So I was like, okay, we've got five rounds left. Let's just box like that, and then I'll get the finish. So then, obviously, he didn't come out for the eight. I'm going to bring Shane in a minute, but what stones you show between rounds three and six? Yeah, I mean... I just switched off too much, didn't really respect his power that much. He's very awkward, we know that. Um, and it's a weird speed that his shots come out of. But he's a world level fighter, he's proved that time and time again. 52 fights, that was, my, that was his 53rd, my 20th fight. He's been around, he's been a pro since before I even started boxing. 2005, I started boxing 2007. So. It shows how experienced he is, and I'm learning all the time, and I'm still world champion. But that's the great thing. I was going to say that, but you learned so much again tonight. That's what it's about. Every, I'm, I'm far from the finished fighter. I can box a lot better than that, which I showed in that seventh round. Uh, I was breaking him down, and then, um, yeah, but obviously, um, it's a shame. Six and seven, you made it yours. Yeah, yeah, I started taking control, controlling behind the jab, and uh, obviously found, found the finish. Just tell us about that moment where you realised he wasn't coming out for the eight. Yeah, he was sat on his stool when they said um, the, the round, like, you know, seconds, seconds out round eight. And um, he was sat down still, and I was like, ref, come on. And then his corner turned around and stayed in the ring, and I was wondering, I was like, okay, I've, I've hurt him here. Um, I knew I'd hurt him anyway, and I was ready to get to him, but um, obviously he pulled out. You look like you had about another 20 rounds in you. Many congratulations. Let's bring Shane in as well. And, and also, by the way, these people here love you. You're going to keep coming back and back. They don't, lo they don't love me as much as I love them. They're phenomenal. Uh, I, I owe this crowd so much. Jane, um, not to love about this guy. What, what a complete gentleman. Do you know what I mean? He, uh, he can fight. He always is in exciting fights. And he's just, he's exactly the epitome of what a sportsman should be. Last yeah. night I was driving home from, from our fight night show and Carl Frampton was talking about you with Simon Jordan on a show and saying that you always saw things ahead of him when you were his trainer. Obviously, you were very close friends in the past. You always saw things. Your man here tonight said, he told me I see something in his rib, and he started to target it. Well, there's the thing. Once a rib is broken, it builds scar tissue, and it forms, and it just lifts a little bit. Once it's broken, um, it never fully heals. Lawrence Nicoli has a little nick on his front left lip, rib. Yeah, we know everyone's little, uh, little secrets and weaknesses. George Groves had one as well, but it's just you've got to target and you'll be accurate. And he, he, he spent bloody seven rounds trying to find it, but once he found it, it was uh, game over. Congratulations to you tonight, but 
You're going to fight React. Poor soon he's strutting around. I know you want the rematch. I know you want the revenge. He's always strutting around. If that fight gets made next, I'll take him out. Hey, lovely. Congratulations. Enjoy. Back to you guys. Gareth Day Davies speaking to Chris Billum Smith and his head trainer there, Shane McGuigan, who is just sensitive. But the pair of them, two fe nice fellas that are doing extremely well in this boxing game. I say extremely well, that's an understatement because they are absolutely smashing it to pieces and they did that this evening. A wonderful performance for uh, Chris Billum Smith. Um, right, make sure you've got your uh, Instagram on tomorrow morning because. Uh, the man, Spencer Oliver, will be in the sea here in Bournemouth doing the uh, the cold water plunge, won't you, pal? Absolutely. There you, know, you go. Pat D'Angelo down there filming me. We can pull it up there, no problem at all. Budgie smugglers out. Might even bring John Rawling in as well. There he we go. a little paddle. There we you know. go. You can bring me down. You're not getting me in the sea. <laughs> hey, listen, John, John pitching the scene. Red speedos, me running along the beach. You going out, recognising it's a little bit too cold. Me coming in, capturing your pulling... I'm setting the scene nice love here, it. I? I love it, there you go. I love it. Uh, listen, gents, always a pleasure to be alongside you to call these big nights. Another big world title night on TalkSport, and I'm sure you've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on the channel this evening, and if you've been in, uh, enjoying everything that we've been doing uh, on the YouTube Boxing Channel, make sure you subscribe to it, because there'll be plenty more content coming your way uh, over the next few days. I'm sure all the fallout will be on White and Jordan, because Mr. Jordan himself was in attendance tonight, so I'm sure he will be talking about this extensively at 10 o'clock. Uh, tomorrow morning. Don't forget, Jeff Stelling returns on the breakfast show on Monday morning from 6 a.m. alongside Alan McCoy. The boys will tackle all the fallout from tonight's fight and the rest of the weekend sporting action. What a weekend for Bournemouth there. They've still got a world champion in the world of boxing and they went up to the northwest of England and what Man United as well. I'll tell you what, it's going to be a very pro Bournemouth show, that breakfast show. Make sure you get stuck into it. Don't forget, we don't just own the boxing as well on Talk Sport. We own the football too. Champions League returns next week and we'll be keeping you right up to date. Join Adrian Durham on Tuesday for all the goals as they go in from 7 o'clock on Talk Sport. Then on Wednesday, we'll bring your City's trip to Red Star Belgrade on Talk Sport 2 from 5.45. What an epic showdown on the South Coast, and the gentleman is still the king. <laughs>